So Michael Robinson, who has been a jack of all trades, well, this year he is settling on one role, and that is the starting quarterback. Robinson now in his senior campaign he has also served as a wide receiver as a running back he has returned punts but he is focusing Mike on his quarterback role this year well it's about time you know he's a fifth year senior Zach Mills he's replacing their best of friends Zach gave him a little toodles before he left his senior year graduation but both of these guys got their degree in December and here's an opportunity for number 12 to take this team to higher higher ground Robinson brings him up to the line of scrimmage Penn State starts at their own 22 yard line. Play action pass. They want to go deep. And the ball is overthrown for Williams. There is a flag down on the play. Well, I like that call early by Galen Hall. You got some freshman young legs out there in the perimeter. Derek Williams can be a very exciting. You saw him in a kickoff return. You already saw him get the ball. Holding. On the defense, number four, 10 yard penalty from the previous spot, automatic, push down. Jim Lapatino, our head referee. Let's check out the Penn State lineup. And the backs and receivers feature Tony Hunt, the running back, Brandon Snow, Derek Williams, Ethan Kilmer, Isaac Smoko, a senior tight end. Up front, left side of the line, very experienced, Levi Brown and Charles Rush. They're joined by Lance and Tolick, Robert Price, and John Wilson. So that penalty brings the ball up to the 33 yard line where it's first and 10 again all over again for the Nittany Lions. Mike you got to like that. I mean Penn State coming right out of the shoot wanting to go deep Robinson rolls the pass is deflected and goes incomplete. Let's check out South Florida defensively and up front for the Bulls. It's Terrence Royal, the senior at right end. He is their star on the defensive front four. As far as the linebackers are concerned, it's Nicholas Moffitt and St. Louis, a very inexperienced defensive secondary. Trey Williams, Carlton Williams, Johnny Jones, and Mike Jenkins, either freshmen or sophomores, except for Johnny Jones, and he's coming back from an injury, missed all of last year with a neck injury. Second and 10 for the Nittany Lions from the shotgun. On the keeper, Robinson rolls forward past the 43. First down, it looks like, for the Nittany Lions. Jim Levitt, he's been the only coach the Bulls have ever known. He started this program literally from a trailer, from a mobile home. And from that very humble beginnings, Jim Levitt has built this program into a Division I team that has now joined the Big East Conference. So another first down for the Nittany Lions. They're nearing midfield up to the 44. On the reversal, here comes Williams. Not much room to run on the right side. He stopped after a gain of two. Dave, what I like here, early Penn State has come down in four different formation groupings. They're trying to get Derek Williams in the first play. Came back with a little inside reverse, motion him back into the backfield. But what Galen Hall has done is trying to get different personnel groupings and see how the young secondary by South Florida is going to match up. And Michael Robinson is taking a look in those inside read plays with the running back. And I just think that this offense has really exploded early first four plays. So far, does Robinson look comfortable to you? Certainly does. I mean, he got one ball deflected early, but there's so much time left in this game. Let's see what happens here. Quick drop. Pass is complete. Looks like yet another first down. The pass is complete on the far side. Uh, Kilmer stopped by Mike Jenkins, but not before they move into the bull territory. Well, again, they come out with his base formation, one of five different formations. They had Kilmer on the outside, a walk-on, converted defensive pack this spring. He catches his first pass as a receiver for Penn State. There's a great story at number 43, Kilmer. Great athlete. We'll talk about him more later. From the South Florida 45 now, the Nittany Lions on the move. No score, just the start of things. Pull up a chair and join us from Happy Valley. Again from the shotgun. Here comes pressure. And a fumble on the play. Looks like South Florida may have recovered. Robinson never saw him coming. Stephen Nicholas came in with the sack, and the ball is then recovered. Well, it's another growing experience for Michael Robinson. 
They tried to set up a screen. They had to blitz off his left side. Here comes a blitz off his left side. It wasn't picked up too well. Robinson's is looking for a middle screen. You got to protect the football. That's one thing that's going to hurt this offense from being very productive. Protect the football. He tried to push it underneath for some reason. Number 81, Smolko. But a great advantage for South Florida. If you're going to win a big game on the road, you got to create turnovers and get a short field. And that's what they have right now. So the Nittany Lions were marching, but that march is stalled. And now South Florida takes over for the first time. And right away, Denson feeling pressure. His pass goes incomplete. Matthew Rice came up from his right end spot, and he was in the face of Courtney Denson. Here's Courtney Denson making the start just a sophomore and a transfer from Auburn. He didn't even play quarterback for Auburn. He was a defensive back. He wanted to go to South Florida or Auburn. He chose Auburn and as a result he thought he could play quarterback there. They said nope you're a DB so he transferred to South Florida after last year. Andre Hall has nowhere to go. Boy a defensive stand by Penn State. Offensively for the Bulls, Andre Hall is their leading rusher. He is joined by Amari Jackson, Jackie Chambers, S.J. Green, Derek Carter, as far as their backs and receivers. On the offensive line, both tackles are inexperienced. Dial and Walker, Davis, Miller, and Carruthers, that's the strength of that offensive line. We're well, testing them early, Dave, on the perimeter. You got Rice and Tabaha Lee putting a lot of pressure off the perimeter. Third and 12 for the Bulls. Denson drops back, comes back, but only to the original line of scrimmage, and South Florida is going to have to punt the ball. You know, you, ha you have an offensive game plan, Dave, and what happens is when you get a quick turnover, your game plan changes. The first 10 scripted plays change because you have a short field. They went with a naked boot that got deflected, incomplete. They went the running play and the quarterback drawn third down. They're just trying to shorten the field even more, make Penn State go 90 yards for a touchdown. Brandon Baker will punt. For South Florida. Punting with a wind at his back. A high punt. Looks like it's going to be taken at the five yard line by Penn State. That's where they'll restart their offense. Right now, no damage done. Penn State turns it over, but their defense holds. One place where sports hottest athletes mix with the glamour of Hollywood. Hey, I'm Andy Roddick. Welcome to my party. ESPN Hollywood takes you inside the celebrity lives of sports top stars. I still got a lot of offers to do movies. The spotlight. It's almost like walking around with Brad Pitt. The sets. That's Reggie Jackson. The shoots. And everything Hollywood. David Beckham, he fit really nicely in Mysterio Lane. ESPN Hollywood. Weeknights at 6 p.m. Eastern on ESPN2. The top five reasons you can't blame the Atlanta Falcons for trading Brett Favre. Were they afraid he'd party his way out of the NFL? He should have been on the cast of Animal House. Did he brag too much for a rookie to all pro Chris Miller? Brett would go up and tell Chris, Chris, go in there and mess it up, baby. I'll be in there by the fourth quarter. And did he flop on the field? I can see why they made the trade. No one knew, including myself, what was to come. The top five reasons you can't blame the Atlanta Falcons for trading Brett Favre. 9 Eastern Monday on ESPN Classic. 28 left to go here in the first quarter from Beaver Stadium State College Pennsylvania 
last night, great fireworks display at Fan Fest. Several thousand people were on hand, and Joe Paterno, as always, fires up that crowd. This guy can't be 78. Come on, are you kidding me? He's like a spring chicken. I tell you, he takes supplements, he works with the players. Tom Bradley says he's doing the same thing in 1975 as he's doing today. So Michael Robinson restarts Penn State's offense in their own shadow of the goalpost. And now we've got a couple of flags coming in, possible face mask call as Tony Hunt was stopped after a gain of a couple. Tony Hunt last year. Get in the run. Automatic. First down. Well, that helps the Nittany Lions get out of the shadow of their goalpost as they get an automatic first down and all the way up to the 21 yard line. Tony Hunt is last year 777 yards rushing, but even he says, hey, all that new speed we have is going to really help open up the field. Well, it certainly is. And Austin Scott, number 33, will be replacing him. They like to tandem their running backs, but Tony Scott, or Tony Hunt, is looking for a big year. In motion, Williams. It's Hunt, and he has stopped before he even gets to the line of scrimmage. Stopped for a loss of one. Terrence Royal was there defensively for South Florida. You can see Tony Hunt's trying to get in stride here, just running an open lead play. Got a lot, of, a lot more experience on the left side of the offensive line with number 67, Levi Brown and Charles Rush. But they got to push that pile a lot further down the field. They're not opening up any holes at all, are they, Mike? No, they're not, but uh, it's bound to happen on the next play. From the shotgun now, Robinson, second and 11. Steps up. Little run to run. Robinson stays on his feet and goes out of bounds. They'll mark it at the 28-yard line. Nice running by Robinson. What's well, nice about Tony Robinson, he's had the experience as a receiver and a running back in past years. When the pocket breaks down or the coverage is too good down the field, number 12 will tuck up inside and get positive yardage. We saw last series he didn't protect the ball very well, but he learned from his mistakes, tucked it up nice, and got some positive yards and allows Penn State to get in a good second and three position. When we talked to Jim Levitt, the head coach of South Florida, he was very concerned about Robinson, called him perhaps the most athletic player on this team. Well, he certainly is, and he's lost 15 pounds. He's down to a pretty good weight that makes him even faster. Now third and three, high snap. A broken play, but Robinson's gonna turn it into something. Staggers at the 32 yard line, but it looks like he has enough for a first down. Well, they certainly do. He's got enough for the first down, Dave. One thing I talking to Galen Hall, the offensive co coordinator, Texas runs a lot of this offense itself with Vince Young. They copied a lot of stuff at the quarterback draw. That was supposed to be a quarterback draw, inadvertent snap. Got loose, but Robinson gathered back and got the first down. That was a heads-up play by Tony Hunt, the running back, to pick up the block there and free Robinson for that run. Well, he, he, yeah, he was the lead blocker in that play, that quarterback draw. You always got to have a lead blocker up inside. And working again from that shotgun, hoping to get a good snap from Antolik. And this time it's perfect. Here comes the reverse. And that's Justin King, the other phenomenal freshman. King still in bounds. Fumbles it out of bounds, but Penn State will have it at the six. Wow. In these early ball games, first game out of the box, you don't know exactly what these freshmen can do, but Justin King checks in the lineup. Tony Robinson, or Michael Robinson, goes ahead and flips it to him. All pure athletic talent. This former quarterback from Gateway High School outside of Pennsylvania, or Pittsburgh, no one's going to bring him down. He's just free moving down the field, making people miss. A lot of dangerous personnel in that field. I should say, a 61-yard run for King. And he's a defensive back, folks. He's going to play both ways for Penn State, but he was recruited as the number one DB in the country. And now some movement up front. Test, test. Offense, number 67. Five-yard penalty from the previous spot. No, David. First down. I'm sorry, but 
you can't have mental errors inside that. You have a great play, 61-yard run. It's just a mental focus down there. And there's an experienced left tackle, Levi Brown. You can't put your offense in a bad position. That's exactly what Joe Paterno was saying over on that sideline. We can't have silly mistakes like that. Boy, especially when they come, as you mentioned, from those experienced players like Levi Brown, who's been a three-year starter. So now Paterno's Lions have the ball at the 11. It's still first and goal. You get inside the red zone here. Number one, the quarterback is thinking protect the football. Number two, you're probably going to see a lot of inside runs with Hunt or even Robinson. They don't like to throw the ball a lot down in the red zone, but you might see Hunt getting out of the backfield in the swing route. South Florida, they really weren't sure what they were going to do defensively there, and they're forced to take a timeout. They were scrambling on the play. They were making timeout. some late substitutions. First one of the half. So let's go now to our ESPN Plus College Game Day studio and Mike Gleason. Mike. Well, Dave, it's final in Norman. The Sooners of Oklahoma in the national championship game the last two years. Big fourth down sack for Jared Kessler of TCU. And of course, Adrian Peterson went out with the high ankle sprain. But the bottom line is TCU wins at 17 10 over Oklahoma, Dave. Amazing upset today. Boy, a double whammy for the Sooners to lose their outstanding sophomore tailback and lose the game on top of that. Well, you lose your last game of the year against USC in a national championship. You come out here and lay an egg against TCU in your home backyard. Mm. Doesn't say a lot for the program, but more importantly, Adrian Peterson, I don't know what the status of his injury is. And of course, Jim Levitt, he used to coach with Bob Stoops. They were both at Kansas State together, and Levitt likes to kid that he taught Stoops everything he knows. <laughs> and of course, part of, part of that is true, really. Levitt was the defensive coordinator, and Stoops worked under him. Well, known Bobby Stoops and Michael Stoops, Jim Levitt, they're extremely competitive. And you get under this guy's skin, Jim Levitt, he's going to give you an earful. He's the guy that wants to put the helmet and pads back on and get in someone's face. And that's what kind of coach you want to have after 10 years at the program, building from a mobile home to a Big East contender and first year in. I give kudos to this man right here. No question. So first and goal for the Nittany Lions at the 11-yard line as they come back into play with right at nine minutes remaining in this opening quarter. Robinson on the keeper. Fighting for yards inside the five down to the four. We talked about a little while ago Vince Young from Texas the quarterback has been known to do this throughout his whole career. Now Michael Robinson is going to go ahead and read option inside. He's reading a defensive end. If the defensive end closes down. He's going to go ahead and keep it and try to get to the outside like he did in that last play. So a gain of seven. Second and goal at the four. And State, remember, started this drive way back on their own five-yard line. A big chunk of that by Justin King, 61 yards. On the draw, stopped at the five and then pushed back to the six-yard line. Jones was there, Alan Cray was there, that defensive front four for South Florida. You know, when you get down the red zone, obviously your goal is to put the ball in the end zone with six points. But when you don't expand your playbook and allow this quarterback to run pass option, that was a quarterback draw. Probably the third one we saw here early in the first quarter. Nice job by South Florida st stacking up that defensive interior line. I look for Penn State to do something here on third down. You got to go into the end zone because you can't get a first down in this territory. From the shotgun, Robinson. Across the middle, almost intercepted. Trey Williams was there. So was Tyler Roberts. And that pass was almost picked off. You know, Michael Robinson stared at the receiver the whole time. The linebacker was just in his throwing lane. Nice job by defensive back Trey Williams and, and Tyler Roberts. But the bottom line for Penn State's offense, they have to finish drives, Dave. They go 95 yards or 90 yards, actually. And they fall short. An incompletion on third down and two inadvertent run plays. So now redshirt freshman Kevin Kelly will try for the field goal. This is a 23 yard try for the left footed Kelly. It is up and it is true. And Penn State is on the board. Joe Paterno may not be thrilled but his team has the lead. 723 remaining in the first quarter. As the
Shia. Please rise for our couple's first dance as husband and wife. <laughs> One place where sports' hottest athletes mix with the glamour of Hollywood. Hey, I'm Andy Roddick. Welcome to my party. ESPN Hollywood takes you inside the celebrity lives of sports' top stars. I still got a lot of offers to do movies. The spotlight. It's almost like walking around with Brad Pitt. The sets. That's Reggie Jackson. The shoots. And everything Hollywood. David Beckham, he fit really nicely in Mysterio Lane. ESPN Hollywood. Weeknights at 6 p.m. Eastern on ESPN2. The top five reasons you can't blame the Atlanta Falcons for trading Brett Favre. Were they afraid he'd party his way out of the NFL? He should have been on the cast of Animal House. Did he brag too much for a rookie to all pro Chris Miller? Brett would go up and tell Chris, Chris, go in there and mess it up, baby. I'll be in there by the fourth quarter. And did he flop on the field? I can see why they made the trade. No one knew, including myself, what was to come. The top five reasons you can't blame the Atlanta Falcons for trading Brett Favre. 9 Eastern Monday on ESPN Classic. Great college football. Saturday, check your local listings for more information. So Kevin Kelly, the redshirt freshman, caps that scoring drive of nine plays and 89 yards. And remember, 61 of that belonged to Justin King in a reverse. And a drive that lasted four minutes and five seconds. He's well received at Justin King. One play, 61 yard run, Dave. It's pretty electrifying. Jackie Chambers, Andre Hall are back deep awaiting the kick of Kelly. Kicking in to the wind. High end over end kick will settle right at the goal line. And that's Chambers. Doesn't even reach the 20. Stopped at the 18. Let's go to Mike Gleason in the studio, Mike. Well, Dave, Ron Zook is victorious in his debut in Champaign. They trail 27-10 at one juncture. This is Pierre Thomas in overtime. They win it 33-30 over Rutgers. Up in Michigan, Wolverines score first against Northern Illinois. Chad Henney doesn't have Braylon Edwards, but he has Jason Avant. He goes up and grabs it. Wolverines on top, 7-zip. Dave? All right, so in the big house, Michigan with the lead, and congratulations to Ron Zook moving up from Florida to Illinois, or I should say over to. Maybe it depends on how you look at that, whether that's an upward move or not. So Courtney Denson will stop this play before it ever gets going. As we're going to have a procedure call right against snap. South Florida. Ball start. Offense. Number 18. Five yard Amari Jackson. Still first down. Amari Jackson, a guilty party. And those are the little things. You talked about the little thing of Penn State, you know, having a five yard penalty at the five yard line. But boy, when you're South Florida, you can't make any mistakes coming into a place like this. Well, your margin of error is zero. You can't do anything like that on the road, or else Penn State will capitalize on it. Especially this defense. Wow. Somehow, Hall stays on his feet, no whistle, and he gets it back to the 15. It's still not to the original line of scrimmage, but Hall bounced out of one tackle from Tim Shaw, and then it's finally from Jay Alford, I should say, and then finally wrapped up by Tim Shaw. Well, Andre Hall, we talked about it in the open. He gets his pad level down low. He fought his way out of the tackle there and got some positive yards back to almost a two-yard gain, so He's hard to find that pocket. He's got to locate him and pop him. Nine starters returning from this outstanding Penn State defense. Denson to throw. Has to dance out of a possible scram. And now we've got a fumble and a touchdown. Alan Zomitis.
Mike, it was Tom Bahali who really broke that play up. Well, he certainly did. As Courtney Denson came back to the right side, Tom Bahali was able to slap the ball up. But this is a very opportunistic defense, Penn State. They had 24 turnovers they created last year. But Coach Paterno loves when a defense turns the ball over, but he loves me more when they take it back into the end zone. <laughs> See Courtney Denson on the outside looking for receiver coverage downfield turns back inside once he turns back inside Tim Shaw gets his paw in there now Kelly for the extra point it's good and just like that it's 10 nothing Penn State each team with a turnover but the one for the Bulls far more costly that's well, something Jim Lovett the head coach at South Florida did not want to see protect the football when you turn back inside the quarterback position, we saw both quarterbacks lose the football. And a lot of times, Dave, you see quarterbacks get a lot of fumbles caused because they don't tuck the ball away. But nice coverage down the field in the secondary, went to a two deep. The sprint out, they only working a third of the field, and you force the quarterback to run back inside. And that's when turnovers happen. What do they tell you, quarterbacks? When you're a running back, you've got to tuck the ball in a 16 yard return here. For Alan Zemitis. And that's another guy that needs to tuck the ball. I mean, you're not in the end zone yet. I'm sure Coach Paterno or Tom Bradley in the films will say, listen, that could have cost us. We get a turnover, you convert it, but make sure you do it good fundamentals. Zemitis, who was involved in a very serious car accident back in January of 2003. Well, he has fully recovered from that and one of the senior tri captains of this team. Jim Levitt, on the other hand, He's got to be livid with his team. This isn't the way he envisioned things starting off for the 2005 campaign, but right now acting as a cheerleader. Well, they've been in big games before. They've been to Oklahoma, Arkansas, Auburn. So emotionally, this team should be prepared. And a lot of these athletes, Dave, are in the state of Florida, and the competition level is so big, so they're not afraid of any competition, but it's the little things, the emotional, you know, ebb and flow of the game. He's got to stay focused, forget about what happened that last drive, and go ahead and get something going in a positive fashion. Kelly's kick, a good one into the end zone. Trey Williams will down it there. So South Florida will take it at their own 20 yard line. So when you look at what Jim Levitt has built in a very, very short time, I mean, just look at this timeline, Mike. The board approves football in January of 95. That's 10 years ago. They named Jim Levitt as their head coach. He'd been a defensive coordinator at K-State for the last four years. They had their first practice, their first game, first division, one game in 99. They played in Conference USA the last couple of years, and now here they are in the Big East Conference. Let's talk about ebb and flow. I mean, you're going from Division One AA to Conference USA to Independent, now to the Big East. It's got to mess up your recruiting. Again, not much room to run for Ricky Ponton as he comes in and gains a couple. Let's check out the Penn State defensive front line. We've already seen the effects of Tom Bahali, Jay Alford, Jim Shaw, and Matthew Rice. This is linebacker U, after all. Tim Shaw, Tyrell Sales, and Paul Puzlesny. Puzlesny is one of the best in the country. And look at seniors all in that secondary. Zemitis, Harrell, Lowry, and Phillips. We got an empty set by South Florida. We're going to try to go down the field and get one-on-one -on -one matchups. The starting lineups brought to you by Toyota. Matthew Rice getting his hand on that ball. Boy, right now Penn State is, especially on the defensive side of the ball, they are overwhelming the Bulls. Well, they certainly are. They're doing at the line of scrimmage. You know, Tom Bradley, defensive coordinator, talks about getting pressure with the four men up front so you don't have to blitz your linebackers. That's Tom Bradley, defensive coordinator, longtime assistant here at Penn State. And many think he could be the heir apparent. Denson, a little more time to throw. Pass is incomplete. Pass was intended over here on the near side. But it falls incomplete. And again, it's three and out for South Florida. It gets these fans behind him. You get a quick turnover, quick score. You get momentum on your side. You get a three and out. You get these fans off their feet a little bit. It's been nine months since the last time Penn State played an active game. Beating Michigan State in their finale. But they're coming out today 
had on people at the line of scrimmage. Baker's first punt you saw less than 40 yards. Remember though he was kicking to a short field. Calvin Lowry taking it at the 25 and then dances out of bounds right there. Penn State with a field goal and then a defensive recovery of a fumble as Ellen Zamitis makes it 10 0 Nittany Lions here in the first quarter. Sundays, when your game is over, switch over to ESPN News for interviews, news conferences, and complete post game analysis. It was the right play at the right time. The NFL Blitz, Sundays, 4 to 10 p.m., and Mondays, 11 a.m. to 3 p.m., NFL Monday Quarterback, presented by Coors Light. You see the character of this football team. A complete wrap up of the NFL week that was. When he gets you, he's going to hurt you. The NFL Blitz, Sundays, 4 to 10 p.m., and NFL Monday Quarterback, presented by Coors Light, Mondays, 11 a.m. to 3 p.m., only on ESPN News. It doesn't happen often, but every once in a while we got rain delays. Tiger Woods is a career year for anybody. Go, 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 go. Honey, I, I don't know. It could be one hour, it could be four. I just bought myself a digital camera. Did you? What do you do? We just hope it lets up. One place where sports' hottest athletes mix with the glamour of Hollywood. Hey, I'm Andy Roddick. Welcome to my party. ESPN Hollywood takes you inside the celebrity lives of sports' top stars. Still got a lot of offers to do movies. The spotlight. It's almost like walking around with Brad Pitt. The sets. That's Reggie Jackson. The shoots. And everything Hollywood. David Beckham, he fit really nicely in Wisteria Lane. ESPN Hollywood. Weeknights at 6 p.m. Eastern on ESPN2. Paterno's Nittany Lions starting off in good form, leading South Florida 10 0 here, 5.31 to go in the first quarter. Penn State back on the attack, starting at the 24 yard line, first and 10. Deep toss, Williams, and it's overthrown by Robinson. Let's go to Mike Gleason in the studio. Mike. Well, Dave, we're heading west to the big annual showdown between the Rams of Colorado State and the Buffaloes of Colorado. Rams grab the upper hand early in this one. Jimmy Green with the touchdown. Seven zip. Rams on top of the Buffs. Dave? It's a great rivalry, and it's been a long time since the Rams have won in Boulder. So we'll see how that plays out. I thought they usually played that game the latter part of the year during rivalries, no. but always first part of the year. Why right? not? Yeah. Get it out of the way. That's right. Hey, what a great weekend of college football. Huh? It's been tremendous thus far. Here comes Golden. And true to his name, a first down up to the 39. But Terrell Golden's another guy, Southmore, that can be pretty electrifying. He wants to compete with Derek Williams and also Justin King. But Terrell Golden, you get guys that compete on a high level, you get these young guys come in there. It just increases your production on the field. Well, they are young, especially at that receiver position. Talented, but young. And they lost Mark Rubin, a sophomore. The one guy that had the most experience to an ankle injury, he's lost for the year. Again, from the option, Robinson keeps it, dives forward for a couple of yards, past the 40, up to the 42, where Tim Jones stops him. You know, it's a nice tempo. They're starting to get into a running rhythm. They're trying to get the offensive line with their pad level down. Coming off the ball, you got a 10 point lead here in the first quarter. Let's grind it out and throw some physical toughness. And that's one thing Penn State needs to mature on more consistency, long accumulated drives, but finishing drives with touchdowns at the end result. So Robinson under center. Second down, seven yards to go. 
little flare pass. Hunt eludes a tackle across midfield down to the 46 of South Florida. They did play all started because he had good protection at the line of scrimmage. And Michael Robinson starts to get into a rhythm, running the football and throwing. But num watch the fullback, number 30, Brandon Snow, popped the middle linebacker. Right in his nose, frees him up a little bit, gets hunt on the perimeter. He had 38 receptions last year. One of the leading receivers on the team, and not a better way to get 15 yards in a hurry. Yeah, gain of 11 officially to the 46 yard line. This time the inside give is to Hunt. He's spinning around but only gets a couple. His forward progress will only give him a yard up to the 45 yard line. Mike, what's it like when you know? I mean, here's Robinson. He's kind of served all these different roles, and now he knows going into spring drills and then even into the fall that he is Joe Paterno's choice at quarterback. Well, he, it frees your mind up. It allows you to stay focused on one particular position. You know, your, your study film is cut down to just studying tendencies by the defense, but from a mindset standpoint, it just frees him up to do as much as he wants to do and just focus on his reads and his progression. Robinson pulled down. Eric Thomas got in there and yanked him down. It'll be a huge loss for Penn State all the way back to their own 43 yard line. Well, that's just the hustle sack right there. Eric Thomas, number 50. You know, Penn State's getting a pretty good rhythm, but Eric Thomas breaks through a one on one block and he gets blocked right into Robinson. Tremendous play by USF. Brings up a third and long. But that's the way you stop a team that's putting things together. They get a big turnover, they get a touchdown. You try to interrupt things by a big play in a defense, and a sack has to happen. Third and 21 for the Nittany Lions. Robinson wide open across the middle is his tight end, Smolko. Ball comes loose, but they're going to rule it down at the 39-yard line. It'll be shy of the first down mark by three yards. Well, there's another guy that needs to get in the mix. Isaac Smoko, the tight end. Coaches love him. Zach Mills is a big fan of his last year. He tried to get him a ball, but he's matured greatly. And anytime you can get a tight end in your flow game, it's going to expand your offense. But here's the contact. The knee, elbows down, elbows as good as two knees. Ball comes out, the ground cannot cause a fumble. Campanos will come on to punt for the first time. Smolko with a nice catch there, but just a little bit shy of the first time at third and 21. A little bit too much. A kick that takes a good bounce and they'll mark it out at the 11 yard line. That's where South Florida will begin again. Let's go to Mike Gleason in the studio, Mike. Well, Dave, up in uh, the big house, uh, Michigan scores again. Uh, Chad Henney, 25 touchdown passes last year. Two now. This one to Mike Hart. You better tackle Mike Hart. You get him the ball in the open field. This guy's a great runner, Tom. Oh, get him out there. He makes you look bad. No question. So Michigan, a couple of touchdowns, 14-3 over Northern Illinois, Dave. Very good. Thanks, Mike. That's a player talking about sophomore year. He hasn't fallen down at all. That's Chad Henney mm. right here from the great state of Pennsylvania. Look at where South Florida has had to begin. Of course, that one time they were able to recover that fumble and start in Penn State territory. Since then, it's been near their own end line. And this one, a gain of a couple up to the 14 yard line where Matt Rice makes the stop. You're seeing both these teams go to that shotgun, that inside zone read option. And that was made famous last year in the Rose Bowl by Mr. Vince Young down at Texas. But the bottom line here. They need to get something, some productivity here in the first quarter. You need to change the field, so to speak. Get to the 50-yard line. And if you don't make it, go ahead and punt. <laughs> Love to love it over on the sideline, pleading with a field judge, Al Terry. Come on, give me a break. There's 100,000 people against us here. That one caught and then dropped. They're going to call it incomplete. Incomplete. Now, Pat Jolmis is the new quarterback. And, of course, he's the old quarterback. He started 10 of 11 games last year. And this isn't very – it's not very uncharacteristic for Coach Jim Levitt to tandem his quarterbacks. He's got a lot of experience. But the bottom line, if the receivers don't catch it, none of these quarterbacks are going to be, you know, successful for South Florida. It was a big crutch last year. They had many drops, many, many drops. And that was one example right there that's not going to help your offense out. So Denson, that experiment lasted less than a quarter. Jolmis comes in 
to relieve him and he's facing third and seven from the shotgun. Now we've got a whistle and a flag. Might be a delay. Delay game. game. Offense. Number three. Five yard penalty. Previous spot. Still third down. Levitt's reaction priceless. Just bowing his head. Oh. You know, coaches just hate getting beat mentally. I mean, things you can't control. The pre snap penalties, Dave, is something you talk about, you harp about in meetings, and you had nine months to get, kind of get their mindset in the right fashion. But on game day, it's, it's a different animal. Already nail biting time for Levitt. Back him up five more. Pass across the middle. Picked off. Chris Harrell. Harrell down to the 14 and a flag comes in after the interception. We do have a flag down. It's probably a block in the back of some kind on a return, but Chris Harrell returns to the Penn State offense or defense actually after a year hiatus with a neck injury. There is no foul in play. No foul in the play. First down. That's something that Penn State's defense thrived on. It's a deflected ball, but it go, this ball should have been caught. I don't, I don't think the quarterback was thrown to the guy crossing the field. I think he was thrown to number nine. Johnny Payton was going through the seam there, but when you get a tip ball in a short field like that, Chris Sorrell back in action here in 2005. was absent last year with a neck injury, but again, a defense taking turnovers and making positive situations. Hunt, hunting for some room, gets inside the 10, down to maybe the nine yard line. I'm going to go back to Harrell. I mean, as you mentioned, missed all of last year with that neck injury. So I mentioned nine starters back on defense for Penn State. And if you count Harrell, who was a starter before he got hurt, that's 10. And then Dan Connor, of course, I don't know when he's going to be back in this lineup. Uh, he got himself into a little bit of trouble with some prank calls, and he's indefinitely suspended by the coach. Well, but not only Joe Paterno is a coach, a father figure, but he's the dean of this team. <laughs> He sets a discipline code when these guys are out of line, but you know Dan Connor will be back at some point in time. We don't know. Only five seconds remaining in this first quarter. Puts a lot of pressure on South Florida when you have two consecutive turnovers in your own end zone, in your own side of the field. Puts a defensive coordinator behind, but they got they got to play football. Jim Levitt says, "All right, that's all right. Not a great quarter, but we'll try to make up for it as we go." That first quarter did belong to the Nittany Lions of Penn State. They had a lot to cheer about. Justin King and the rest roll up a 10-0 lead and they're threatening again. for the gridiron with your favorite NFL and college football apparel at ESPNshop.com. You want it? We've got it. From clothes to cleats and everything in between. So as you get ready for the new season, gear up at ESPNshop.com or call 1-800-762-1701 for a free catalog. 
ESPN Fantasy Football is so easy to use. Yeah, and it doesn't require a major time commitment. And we love the camaraderie it engenders. The way we're talking is so weird. This room and our clothes. Brandy, Randy, Candy, I don't think we exist. What, what do, do you mean, mean Sandy? Sandy? I think we're just part of some guy's fantasy, and whoever he is, he obviously loves ESPN Fantasy Football, and we're just icing on the cake. Ooh, oh. there's cake? <sighs> ESPN Fantasy Football. Play for free at ESPN.com slash fantasy football. A great sportscaster once promised to tell it like it is. Not quite. Because first you have to tell it like it was. Every weeknight, Classic Now will take breaking sports news and give it to you with a deep perspective and backstory from yesterday to today and back. All in one show. I'm Josh Elliott. Join me for Classic Now, where the past is always present. 7 and 11 p.m. every weeknight, only on ESPN Classic. If you don't have ESPN Classic, get Classic Now. You see Chris Perel, one of the great outstanding uh, Penn State Nittany Lion defenders, and boy, they've got a ton of them with this 10 0 lead. Tom Bradley's squad, total defense last year, 10th in the country, scoring defense, 5th in the country. And when we asked Bradley about that, he said, You know what? I don't want to talk about last year. Last year was last year. Let's talk about this year. But he's got almost all of those guys back, and if you're a defensive coordinator, you got to love that. Absolutely. Second and six from the nine. Robinson looking for the end zone, stopped at the one. First and goal from the one. That's exactly what you want to do if you're Penn State. They went to a running attack the last couple of plays. You get inside here, you got to finish the drive off. Six points is a lot greater than three, obviously. But Michael Robinson at the helm right now. It's good to have the ball in his hands. Robinson heard all of his critics, read all of those letters to the editor, the angry fan mail, the emails that came his way, and he said that criticism served as that criticism really served him well because it just made him tougher and made him want to achieve more. That's what happens to quarterbacks. It makes you tougher when people talk about you. Sound like a man of experience. Up over the top. Touchdown! Tony Hunt! I give credit to the defense there. They, they got that touchdown for him. The turnover happens. The offense finishes off the drive. Very complimentary offensive defense schemes here. That's how you coach football, and that's how you execute as a player. The mindset is when a turnover happens, we have to convert and get touchdowns, and that's how you get better as a football team. First time they had that turnover. Remember, Penn State only got a field goal out of it. That's got to make their defense feel even better. We handed you a gift, and you took advantage of it. Forget the kick. Flags flying before. Prior to the snap, ball start. Offense, number 67. Five-yard penalty. Trial comes from the eight-yard line. Well, the backup Kevin Kelly five yards. Nothing new for him. He'll just go to an eight iron and just punch it through there. There you go. Penn State trying to take a 17 nothing advantage and South Florida is just not moving the ball at all. <laughs> Kelly's kick is good. And it is 17 nothing as we send you to Mike Gleason in the studio. Well Dave Northern Illinois Michael Turner made a name for himself for the Huskies last year Garrett Wolf at 1600 here he goes experiencing a touchdown in the big house. That's great defensive football teams Mike don't give long runs up long runs like that at home. This is very disappointing on Michigan's defense. Well Dave it's 14 10 Michigan by four. So Michigan getting themselves a little bit of a test from Northern Illinois today. And boy, when they get into that locker room, I wouldn't be surprised if Lloyd Carr shows them that Oklahoma score. Oh, exactly. Going back in a touchdown, just Tony Hunt up, up over the top. You got your center and right guard doing a heck of a job coming off with the snap count. Lance Odelick and, and Robert Price on the inside, and Charles Rush, number 59, does a nice job getting up inside. But it's nice to see Tony Hunt in the end zone for an offense that was in that last year. 
I don't think they scored 17 points in the first quarter, Dave, in a long time. That's right. What a great sight, huh? Uh, Beaver Stadium, University Park, Pennsylvania, Penn State, South Florida, meeting for the very first time. In fact, South Florida has ne never met even a team from the Big Ten Conference. With Mike Tomczak, I'm Dave Armstrong, watching Penn State take advantage of a couple of South Florida turnovers and turn it into a big lead and booming it through the end zone is Kelly so the Bulls will have to start on their own 20 yard line boy they have been backed up all day long with that one exception of the Robinson fumble in early in the game yeah, they've had bad field position and like you said that one opportunity was missed by South Florida but they have yet to complete a pass I mean they're over you know in the first quarter and now they're gonna bring I don't know it's quarterback I guess Julius is back in a quarterback and they're going to platoon these guys throughout the year until they find somebody with some cover because Courtney Denson doesn't really have a lot of experience and Coach Levitt wants to go with Jules Smith right now. Julius given time. His throw is just a little bit low and incomplete as we send you back to Mike Gleason. Well, they the Eagles of BC, of course, a member of the ACC this season. Now they're warming up uh, out in Utah against BYU. Chris Miller, touchdown, Eagles. And they strike first. It's a seven nothing. A BC on top of BYU. Let's back out to Beaver Stadium and Dave. Thanks, Mike. Guys in the studio doing a great job keeping us updated on everything going on around a beautiful college football Saturday. Second and ten at the twenty. Fumbled a little bit by Jewel Miss. He recovers in time to take it across the line of scrimmage. Gain of three up to the 23, but that'll bring up third and seven. You now talking to Rod Smith, the offensive coordinator for South Florida, and his mindset of going to his quarterback rotation. They didn't think they'd go to Jewel Miss this quickly in the first quarter, but something they saw up in a box, they decided to make the change at quarterback, but they're just trying to get something positive here. And third down is a prime example. They're 0 for, 0 for 6 on throwing and catching, but it's unfortunate that his drop pass is going to quarterback stats. Yeah, Rod Smith, the offensive coordinator, working up a sweat up in that booth. Why not? Not much offense so far today for South Florida. Julmas dancing around. And again, a pass that absolutely should have been caught by Johnny Payton right through his hands. Again, that was their Achilles heel last year. They had 25 drops in the last four weeks of the season. And that's something, it's, a, it's just a you know mental capacity these receivers the coach checked them for check their eyes check their hands but fundamentally a young receiver at this level look everything into your mitts don't take your eye off the ball make sure you catch first run second Mike what do you tell your receivers when they're dropping the ball like that well they come back and I throw the ball with them on the sideline just to give them some confidence of catching the football no one's doing that right now and he carried a punt you saw Lowry back to get it for Penn State Boy, almost blocked. It took Baker forever to get that one away. Lowry comes up across midfield and out of bounds at the 45. So Penn State, Joe Paterno's Nittany Lions are back inside Bulls territory, already leading 17 0. Game day built by the Home Depot Saturdays 10:30 a.m. Eastern on ESPN. Stephen A. Smith is talking to the biggest names in sports. Give it up, Allen Iverson. Some people get scared of who you are. I'm not perfect. Ron Artest. Why did you go into the crowd? I reacted before I thought. Drew Rosenhaus. Find one team. That won't deal with me. Gary Sheffield. I'm very disgusted with the Yankees. Larry Brown. I got fired. That's the bottom line. Quite frankly, with Stephen A. Smith. Weeknights at 6.30 Eastern on ESPN2. Is Derek G the best shortstop ever? Well, in the pantheon of Yankee shortstops, I definitely put him ahead of Scooter and Crescetti. Yeah, his limited power drags down his OPS a little, but he's still one of the most clutch hitters of all time. He turns that mean 6-4-3, and he's got the soft hands of Hannes Wagner, and even Boston fans call him Captain Intangible. 
How do you know you're soft hands? Classic Now with host Josh Elliott, 7 and 11 p.m. every weeknight, only on ESPN Classic. If you don't have ESPN Classic, get Classic Now. Please rise for our couple's first dance as husband and wife. <laughs> Bradley, his team pitching a shutout so far. Penn State leading 17 to nothing. His defense has been tenacious. Well, I haven't seen anything by South Florida that's going to make him worry, but it can happen in a second, especially with skilled receivers on the outside. But if I'm Jim Levitt, I'm going to get those receivers together and start throwing the ball back and forth to one another because obviously opportunistic defense, as we see here, is taking advantage of the miscues by South Florida. When you get that chance, though, to catch the ball, and Cedric Hill was wide open there, you've got to be able to make that catch. And I'm interested to see if maybe they'll take your advice and start throwing that ball over on the sideline as Robinson takes it across on the left side, works it up a couple of yards up to the 43-yard line of South Florida. Now Michael Robinson, we talked earlier, has dropped 12 pounds in the offseason, become more physical in the weight room, but his quickness and his durability is going to allow him to get through this season. He's going to take a lot of pounding. I think he already has carried the ball six or seven times here early in the first half. And with that, with that said, he's going to have to toughen his body up a little bit more as we get into the Big Ten season. Yeah, he had that red shirt on in the fall, didn't he? Yeah, he certainly did. Now it's off. <laughs> Good play in the flat. That ball is caught on the near side by Austin Scott, Mike Jenkins. There's Jay Paterno, coach's son and quarterback's coach, sitting next to Galen Hall, the offensive coordinator. And they communicate very well. I know last year was extremely frustrating. They were 103rd in total offense last year, 104 the year before. And that's humbling, especially when you're the coach's son or coaching the quarterbacks. And the productivity was absent in a lot of positions, not just the quarterback position. Third and four for the Nittany Lions. They need the 35. Look out, Robinson sacked again. And there's that man, Stephen Nicholas. Nicholas on the Buckus Award watch list. And Stephen Nicholas with his second sack of the game. The other one produced a fumble. This time Robinson hangs on. Well, Robinson missed a great opportunity. Smoko was going right across the middle and had nobody covering. They had a busted coverage in the secondary. Just that little recognition whether it takes you know half a second for Robinson to feel the blitz, find the open receiver, and that'll come in ensuing weeks as, he's, as he reps, reps it a lot more. Well, Penn State to punt. Jeremy Capinos. Jackie Chambers back at his own 10 for South Florida. Capinos with a high kick. This one's going to bounce to the five and it bounces right into right into the lap of Donnie Johnson who stops it at the five yard line. That's where Jim Levitt's group will have to regroup trailing 17 nothing.
is one place where sports hottest athletes mix with the glamour of Hollywood. Hey, I'm Andy Roddick. Welcome to my party. ESPN Hollywood takes you inside the celebrity lives of sports top stars. I still got a lot of offers to do movies. The spotlight. It's almost like walking around with Brad Pitt. The sets. That's Reggie Jackson. The shoots. And everything Hollywood. David Beckham, he fit really nicely in Mysterio Lane. ESPN Hollywood. Weeknights at 6 p.m. Eastern on ESPN2. The top five reasons you can't blame the Atlanta Falcons for trading Brett Favre. Were they afraid he'd party his way out of the NFL? He should have been on the cast of Animal House. Did he brag too much for a rookie to all pro Chris Miller? Brett would go up and tell Chris, Chris, go in there and mess it up, baby. I'll be in there by the fourth quarter. And did he flop on the field? I can see why they made the trade. No one knew, including myself, what was to come. The top five reasons you can't blame the Atlanta Falcons for trading Brett Favre. 9 Eastern Monday on ESPN Classic. South Florida begins again way back in their own territory this time at the seven they have averaged starting at the 23 and if you throw out the one fumble recovery it'd be a lot worse than that. Meanwhile Penn State is average starting on their own 40. Andre Hall not much room to run as we send you back to Mike Gleason in our studio. Well, they have the Wolverines are back on the scoreboard, uh, but Tom, this time they can thank their defense, huh? Yeah, I tell you what, Michigan taking care of field position right here, popping it over, getting up 10. So Mike Hart with a second touchdown. Wolverines up 20 to 10 right now, Dave. He's able to get one there. And Michigan leading by 10. Here it's all Penn State leading 17-0, and South Florida has done very little offensively. Now Julmas changing the play at the line. 100,000 trying to disrupt things. And the Hall gain of one. Tamba Holly was right there to stop that play. And it's going to bring up third and relatively long again. You know, Penn State has done a tremendous job over the years of just running to the football. Their interior defensive linemen, secondary linebackers are all converging to the ball, and they always finish off tackles. No one takes a play off. Very well disciplined and well coached. And look at only 15 total yards for South Florida and Penn State 139 but they've started on a short field a lot. They have more yards than that. This time caught by Chambers and looks like he's got a first down. Well if it is that's the first completion by South Florida. Here we are halfway through the second quarter we're finally getting a completion but Chambers does a nice job sitting down in the zone. Hopefully that builds a little bit of confidence for Pat Julmas in this offense because they've had bad field position ever since this game started. Mike, that's their first first down. Their first one. And it's still back at their own 18-yard line. That student section really letting Julmas hear it down in that end of the field. Paul able to gain about three or four. And that student section loud and strong. Extremely boisterous. They get here early, don't they? They certainly do. They camp out. It's all general admission for those students, and they set them in sections. Seniors, juniors, sophomores, freshmen. Maybe someday one of my kids might be sitting in that section. Who knows? Yeah, you start off in the very end of the end zone and you work your way around a little bit as you get a little older. Yeah. <laughs> Second and six after the gain of four. Julmas with a quick toss inside the hall. Nice play. They get it up to the 26 yard line where Paul Puzlesny is able to make the stop. Well, I like this tempo that South Florida is trying to develop here. They're trying to get a couple first downs, try to get back in sync with a shovel pass. But just like a completion, it is a completion. Just another way to get number two, Andre Hall, into the flow of the game. There's Puzlesny, number 31, one of the captains on this team. And guys, he's just a junior. First junior captain at Penn State since 1968. That ought to tell you all you need to know. There goes Hall busting through the middle. Another first down for South Florida. He gets it up to the 36, where he's finally stopped by Calvin Lowry. Like we talked about just a while ago, first downs, being able to convert, just a general zone play with the guard coming and trapping from the inside out. 
Hall getting his pads down, but some positive yards here for South Florida. Something they they had 15 yards, I believe, in the first quarter total offense. And right now they're starting to put a few first downs together. Mike, it looks like they're trying to attack the interior a little bit. They've tried the wings and that didn't work. I agree with you. Now a timeout here by South Florida. Their second of this first half. Timeout. They want to talk things South over. Florida, second one of the half. So Jim Levitt, he doesn't like the timeout call there because really that's first game confusion more than anything else. Well, it is, but you'd rather get into the right play. And I think the quarterback should have the luxury of calling timeouts, using his, using what he's taught by the coaches, taking a situation where communication isn't in your advantage. Let's get sure. Let's get it right. We've still got a lot of time in this game, and you're getting something put together with a couple first downs. Andre Hall, of course, one of the uh, senior leaders of this team, and Hall was telling us before the game about the expectations for South Florida this year. We're really special, man. All around positions, we 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 deep in on a depth chart, you know, from the old line to the safeties, quarterbacks, linebackers, D line. I mean, everybody wants to play, you know. And by credit, they they don't have to give it to us. We're gonna go out and get it this year. We're gonna take it. One way we'll, or we'll see what happens. They were four and seven last year, three and five in the conference USA. Now moving up to the Big East Conference. First and ten, ball on the 36-yard line from the shotgun. Julmus going up top. He has a man, but he overthrows his intended receiver, Carlton Hill, who's just a freshman, a true freshman, and a third-string quarterback. Yeah, very heralded quarterback coming out of Florida. They won that recruiting battle, Coach Jim Levitt, between Miami and South Florida. We get Carlton Hill on the outside as a burner, 4-3 guy. Doesn't have a lot of experience at receiver because he is a third team quarterback, but they're trying to get him some game experience, Dave. They're trying to get his feet wet as he matures in that role of quarterback. Rod Smith, the offensive coordinator for South Florida, telling us that Carlton Hill, probably the biggest recruit South Florida has ever landed. Look at their drive so far. Jewel Miss rolls out. Pass was deflected, but right to a teammate. And the pass is caught right near midfield. And you're starting to see some consistency by this offense. Get the running game going. You get a few first downs going. You're allowed to make play action fakes upside in the line of scrimmage. You get Julemus on the outside. He's got a high to low. It's his read progression. You go deep to short when you get out there with a naked boot. Very successful, well executed play by Julemus. Will Bleakley was able to make the catch off the deflection from his own teammate, Mike Ruger, and that is a legal play. A lot of people think that's not legal. And they got three consecutive receptions by the receiver so I think they found that stick him on the sideline on the reverse a trip in the backfield an opportunistic play there for Scott Paxson as he trips uphill every arm every limb sometimes you get called for a penalty on the offense if you use your tripping but defense as long as you're in the interior structure of the play from tackle to tackle, you can use those body parts. Nice hustle play by Scott Paxson. This could be a nice reverse here coming up to Carlton Hill, but number 41's there, making a negative play. Loss of eight brings up second and 18. Sometimes Wait. you don't know what you're doing. You just kind of <laughs> react, and you see the ball right above you. Just put your body out. Jim Levitt's going, what else can go wrong? <laughs> Julmas drops back. And the quarterback keeper just gains a couple, and now it's going to bring up third and 16. I think they're trying to get something positive here, trying to get that third down situation a little bit more manageable. But a third and 15, they really haven't had much success throwing the ball down the field. When they have, it's been picked off once, and they had a fumble recovery for a touchdown. But in order to get back in this ball game, Dave, they got to convert a third down here. Motioning to his defense. Dual miss. His throw was a little bit low. 
Would have been enough for the first down, but the throw intended for Amari Jackson is too low. Here you got a guy 6'5", and you throw it into the ground. Well, he, I know he didn't do it intentionally, but he just had bad fundamentals when he threw the, threw the ball down the field. You had the right play call. The blitz was coming. Stay relaxed and poised in the pocket and give Amari Jackson an opportunity to catch the ball. What was wrong with his fundamentals? Well, he overstrided there. He was looking at the receiver the whole time instead of staying tall in the pocket and go ahead and deliver that strike and trust it. That was a knock on him the last couple of years with his accuracy. It's, it can all be corrected. Almost blocked again. And they'll let it go, and the ball is stopped at the two yard line, and there is a flag way back where Brandon Baker made that punt. Looks like there might be roughing the kicker. Personal foul, roughing the kicker. Defense, number 29. 15 yard penalty from the previous spot. Automatic. First down. Well, this is the break that South Florida has been looking for. You got to stay off the kicker. He's just like the quarterback. You got to know exactly where you're going. Go through the kick. Don't even. And the kickers do a nice job. Punters do a nice job of leaving his leg up in the air to cause that roughing the kicker. Nice acting job by Baker. At the end result, Penn State's defense is back on the field. That's the first time, second time actually, that South Florida is in Penn State territory. Remember, they recovered the fumble earlier and were in Penn State territory then. Didn't do anything with it. You know, it's interesting as Joe Paterno has always had a nice ongoing relationship with those side judges close to his sideline over the years. Paul. Boy, look at him spin and finally brought down, but not before he gains almost 20 on the play down to the 20. What a run by Andre Hall. Well, we talked about he's hard to find when you pull that left tackle. Number 55 back to the right side. Watson, he frees up Hall on the inside. One guy can't bring him down. He's just a guy that knows how to move his body. It's small when contact happens. And here's a guy that can get out a pretty good run. You know, getting the ball, a steady diet up inside. And right, you're right, Dave. They have kind of eliminated their outside perimeter runs. And they've concentrated up inside. 47 yards now for Hall. Remember, before this drive began, South Florida had 15 yards of total offense today. Ricky Ponton with the carry. He gets it down to the 16-yard line. It's not rocket science when, you, when you're coaching football, Dave. They just flipped the formation. They ran the same play to the left side. Which they had success to play before going to the right side, but just great effort. You got, you got uh, Ricky Ponton in there to spell Hall for a little bit. But I'm sure that after this play, Hall's going to get back in there and try to get in the end zone. Second down, six yards to go. So what they did last year when they got into the red zone. And a flag. They might have taken too much time. Prior to the snap. Ball start. Offense. Number 68. Five yard penalty from the previous spot. Still second down. Frank Davis. He was moving before the snap, so that backs you up five yards. Instead of second and six, now you're backed up second and 11. You know, it's, it's interesting. They, they've taken a lot of time to settle in this South Florida team. You know, the ebb and flow of the game, momentum swings. And now they're putting a nice drive together, very poised and very confident drive going for the Bulls. And again, they go right back up through the gut down to the 15. Tom Bradley, I'm sure he's seeing the same thing we're seeing. He's got to make an adjustment now in the middle. What does he do? The left, these linebackers to step up. Tyrell Sells, the freshman starter, filling in for Dan Connor. Number 46 needs to step up. But, you know, I think Tom Bradley right now is content with just making these guys drive the length of the field. Something positive is going to happen for their defense. They're going to try to hold them to a field goal, but they got to attack the line of scrimmage with the linebackers and getting those gaps. Remember, Penn State would have had the ball back if not for the roughing the kicker call. Instead, it's third and five for South Florida at the 15. Julemus. He throws it to the wing and another pass drop. That was a difficult catch, but you can tell by the reaction of Amari Jackson that he thought he should have made the play. You know, there's two types of footballs that a receiver potentially can catch. A nice soft ball that has a good velocity on it or a hard ball. And this, to me, to me from this vantage point, it looks like a hard ball to catch 
And Amari Jackson doesn't help his cause by jumping in the air. He's a six foot four target. Just put your hands up, make the catch. So now Mike Benzer will come on to try to put Levitt's Bulls on the board. And oh, that was a kick that almost went nowhere. Tom Bradley loves it. The shutout still intact as Mike Benzer almost whiffs on the kick. 17 nothing. Penn State remains on top. So with 3:12 to go here in the first half, it's Penn State 17, South Florida nothing. Sundays, when your game is over, switch over to ESPN News for interviews, news conferences, and complete post-game analysis. It was the right play at the right time. The NFL Blitz, Sundays, 4 to 10 p.m. And Mondays, 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. NFL Monday Quarterback, presented by Coors Light. You see the character of this football team. A complete wrap-up of the NFL week that was. When he gets it, he's going to hurt you. The NFL Blitz, Sundays, 4 to 10 p.m. And NFL Monday Quarterback, presented by Coors Light. Mondays, 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. Only on ESPN News. It doesn't happen often, but every once in a while we got rain delays. Tiger Woods is a career year for anybody. Go, 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 go. Honey, I, I don't know. It could be one hour, it could be four. I just bought myself a digital camera. Did you? What do you do? We just hope it lets up. where sports hottest athletes mix with the glamour of Hollywood. Hey, I'm Andy Roddick. Welcome to my party. ESPN Hollywood takes you inside the celebrity lives of sports' top stars. Still got a lot of offers to do movies. The spotlight. It's almost like walking around with Brad Pitt. The sets. That's Reggie Jackson. The shoots. And everything Hollywood. David Beckham, he fit really nicely in Mysterio Lane. ESPN Hollywood. Weeknights at 6 p.m. Eastern on ESPN2. Brandon Baker, a punter by trade, but a holder on this last play, and he's going to look at the tape and realize he was largely responsible for this miss. Well, the holder, it's a thankless job until you mess up, and here's an opportunity that they missed. Baker didn't have a strong hold on that, obviously, but Tom Bradley loves it. This guy is so competitive, Dave. He loves to pitch a shutout for 12 weeks a year, every opportunity he gets, and he's just elated. Last year, the defense did not allow more than 21 points in any game last year in a four and seven season. The only team in the country to do that. Pass caught on the wing by Lydell Sargent. He stopped by Mike Jenkins. Lydell Sargent's another freshman, true freshman in this receiving core. Trying to get him some, him some experience early. And not a better way to just pop up and throw him a quick hitch in the outside. Getting back to that hold, Steve Largent, Hall of Fame wide receiver, used to hold for the Seahawks. Told me once that that was the one job he hated the most. He said, I, I never felt more pressure than when I was holding for field goals. I'll have a thought about that after his play. There's Williams. Good pass from Robinson. I like that execution, that play. You're going vertically down the field the last couple times with Derek Williams. You take him back to the middle of the field, stem towards the post, towards the goal line, and then bring him back out towards the sideline. You get the corner from the inside outside technique, and there's no way you can make a play in that. But they finally made an adjustment. They've been going to some inside routes. That weren't successful. Now they come back with the flag route in the perimeter. Well, Williams with that 25 yard reception. And stayed on the move. Oh, it's picked off. The pass is intercepted on the far side as South Florida comes up with a great pick by Trey Williams. Well, Trey Williams read that the whole way. And they got some skilled players on a defensive side of the ball. Trey Williams, a sophomore from Plant City, Florida. 
was looking at Michael Robinson the whole time. And that's one knock on Robinson. You can't sit there and stare down a receiver. You got to come off that guy and go ahead and hit your check down. But it's all part of managing the game. It's a first and ten situation. Don't do anything to hurt your ball club right before the first half is going to end. So Robinson motioning there to his receiver like curl back in. Well curl back in curl back out but once the ball is thrown poorly the receiver has to turn into a defensive back and knock the ball down and allow yourself a chance to line up again. So it's not all gone well for Penn State they've had two turnovers this half a fumble and now an interception. Jewel miss trying to attack the middle of that Penn State defense again and he does as the pass is caught by Cedric Hill. Let's go to Mike Gleason in the studio. Well, Dave, coming up at halftime, the big story is out of Oklahoma, and it's not good for Sooner fans. In Madison, Omar Jacobs goes off, but he shares the marquee with Brian Calhoun. And Tennessee fans breathing sigh of relief in Knoxville. Dave? Right, thank you very much. Yeah, Norman is right now in a depressed state, I'm sure. And to the 35-yard line goes Jewel Miss. This, ha this has to be a, a, a drive here. He gets some points on the board before he go in the locker room. Take some momentum in there. You get the ball coming out in the second half. You can't miss an opportunity here. And it looks like Julemus is kind of getting into a rhythm where he's making completions and at least giving the receivers a chance to throw the ball accurately and catch it. Levitt's team has already burned a couple of timeouts this half. Clock winding down to 118. A little screen pass to Andre Hall. Still running, finally wrapped up by Lowry, but not before he'll stop the clock to move the chains as the ball goes down to the 20 yard line. That was a great play call by Rod Smith. You know Penn State's going to rush up the field. They allowed a defensive interior lineman to rush up the field, and they slip Andre Hall underneath in a screen. And he's hard to find. We talked about his elusiveness as a runner, but he stays behind, the line of, behind his line blocking very well. Lock on the move again, nearing one minute. Hall. Doesn't get much at all, and this is just going to eat up some clock down to the 19-yard line. Yeah, Tim Shaw does a nice job. He talked about what Penn State has to do defensively to stop that inside run, and Tim Shaw just needs to fill the gap, which he did right there, and made a short tackle and allowed him only a two-yard game. Shaw didn't get a lot of advice on how to play football from his dad. His dad is from England, and he grew up, of course, a soccer player, a different kind of football altogether. Absolutely, Nick. They play with a little bit rounder ball over there when it comes to football. But getting back to my point, you talked about Steve Largen as the holder. It's a thankless job, and I was a holder for a long part of my career in college and professional football. I used to relish it. I used to take it with pride. It's a commitment. It's my job. One player doing his part to help the team become better and dealing with the psyche of kickers, which is another story. Oh, yeah. But my job was to get the ball down, and I was very confident in my hands and my ability to do so. And they say the quarterbacks generally had the better hands in the team because they're the ones that are always playing catch. I asked Steve if he ever muffed one. He said, no, I never did, but I was always afraid I was going to. Hey, I, I muffed one because the ball rolled back in a big game against Jacksonville, and we had a veteran center that had 16 years' experience. I had 15 or 14 years' experience, and Norm Johnson had 18. So we had a combined total of 40-some years' experience. Like I said, it's a thankless job until you mess up. And he center rolled the ball back to me. Ball was kicked into the line of scrimmage, and we lost the game by two points. Baker can't wait to get another opportunity right here. Second down, eight yards to go. Ball in the 19. South Florida is now out of timeouts. Pass is caught down to the seven-yard line. Justin King makes the stop, but not before they get it down to the seven. S.J. Green with the catch. And South Florida's doing a nice job sitting down in the zones. They're bringing somebody vertically, sitting them down, and somebody underneath to hold the linebacker. And Julemus is getting on a nice little roll here with some consecutive completions. So now the clock not as big a factor, although it is going under 30 seconds. First and goal at the seven. Dangerous play here for South Florida. A run with no timeouts remaining. They're going to have to hurry up. Well, I didn't like that play call at all. They're probably going to spike it here and kind of regroup in the huddle, but take a shot in the end zone. You need something positive. I said clock wasn't a factor because I assumed South Florida would throw the ball a few times. I wasn't expecting the run, and a good thing for Penn State that they were. Well, 
right 17 nothing Penn State here with just a few seconds remaining in this first half obviously football on our mind here but also on our mind those folks down in the south in Mississippi Louisiana Alabama and if you would like to help to donate call 1-800-HELP-NOW 1-800-257-7575 for those of you who are Spanish speaking or you can go online www.redcross.org Penn State has also offered any of the students from Tulane or any of those schools that are shut down if they would like to transfer to Penn State they'll make that process as easy as possible and today here at Beaver Stadium they were taking donations for the relief fund our nation is strong and very wealthy but very sympathetic and I think the people sitting in the stands today are very thankful especially when you turn on your television and look at all those depressing pictures but it's a great country we live in and people helping people is going to bring us back together you talked about that opportunity for Baker to come back in as the holder he'll get his chance here see if he can handle it the snap this time. Well, he'll get either a chance on a field goal try or maybe an extra point try, depending on what happens with this next play. Well, they're going to go ahead and kick the field goal here. They're going to kick it? No, they were initially. Yeah. Wow. I think they've changed their mind now. Figuring nine seconds on the clock, they can take a quick hit into the end zone on third down. They might actually be able to get, well, it's third down, so this do or die here in the end zone, they have to kick the field goal if they don't convert. Got to be in the end zone if you're South Florida. They lob one up, a jump ball, and it's caught, and it's a touchdown for Johnny Payton. That's exactly what South Florida needed. Finish the drive, something positive going to the locker room, but that's nothing like a, nothing more than just a backyard. Throw it up in the air. You got Johnny Payton, experienced receiver, but he's got the hops. He catches at his highest point, and you young receivers out there, you hear coaches always talk about catching at the highest point. You saw his eyes right at his hands. Nice drive by South Florida. With time running down, Jim Levitt rolled the dice, and why not? You're down 17 nothing. This time the hold is good, the kick is good, and South Florida is not only on the board, they're within 10. Good drive by Pat Julmus and by Jim Levitt's Bulls as they get on the board. And keep in mind, Dave, that they get the ball coming out in the second half, so if they could take some of this momentum in the locker room, make a couple adjustments with either protection or go, or go ahead and get Andre Hall some more touches because I know Tom Bradley's going to make a few adjustments. They're just playing football, South Florida is. They're poised, and they're going ahead and getting it done. Julmas just throws it up for grabs, and Johnny Payton, the tallest one there. Yeah, you don't really teach this. This is athletic ability, going up and catching it. That's highest points, and that's Justin King. Right over the young freshman. How do you do? This is the big time. They got that ball with two minutes and four seconds on the clock in the first half. They march it down 55 yards in seven plays and score for the first time today. Well, that'll help out this, the statistical side of things. They're throwing some completions and converting first downs and accumulating some yardage. They've already made some adjustments, South Florida, and the biggest adjustment they made came in that second quarter when they quit attacking on the perimeter and started attacking right to the gut of that Penn State defense. Exactly. And that'll bring this first half to a close. So Penn State came out and dominated the first three fifths or three fourths of this first half. But then South Florida comes up with a late score. Let's go now to our ESPN 17 7 at halftime with Mike Tomzak. I'm Dave Armstrong here at Beaver Stadium in State College, Pennsylvania. Mike, at, at one time it looked like this is going to be a Penn State blowout at 17 0. South Florida is not moving the ball. We got a 10 point halftime. Well, it's great momentum swing for South Florida. Penn State could control early, like you said, but Pat Julmas came back. He got some completions going, and Andre Hall got free in the secondary with some runs, but. The bottom line is what they can do the second half. They got 30 minutes to make a play. I think South Florida's back in the ballgame. Well, they certainly got Penn State's attention, I'm sure, as Joe Paterno goes into that locker room at halftime. I'm sure he had plenty to say to his team. And South Florida's got to be buoyed by what they saw in that first half after really getting demolished 
through those first two quarters. So we start the second half of play. South Florida will get the ball first. Kicking off for the Nittany Lions is Kevin Kelly. This kick comes down at the eight yard line. Looking for some room is Jackie Chambers. He's finally stopped at the 37 yard line. That's where South Florida will go on the attack. South Florida started the game with Courtney Denson at quarterback. He only lasted a couple of series. Then Pat Julmis took over from there, and Julmis has been in the game since. When you look at the first half, Julmis, 7 of 14 in that first half, right at 50% with a touchdown and an interception. Hall really came on late with those nine rushes, 48 yards. Not much of a rushing attack for Penn State in that first half, especially if you take out the 61 yard run from Justin King. Andre Hall gets a couple over on the left side. First half. Opportunistic defense by Penn State. Alan Zamidas picks up a fumble and takes it in. Then Tony Hunt on another turnover converts a touchdown. But South Florida was able to come back with Pat Julmas up top to Johnny Payton to get back to a 10 point game. Second down, six yards to go. Julmas dropping back to pass. The pass is caught, but immediately wrapped up. Chris Harello was right there defensively. Statistically, first half. Remember, the rushing yards for Penn State features that 61 yard run. Passing yards about even, and first downs, Mike, ended up being almost even. They certainly did, but the stat I like is that third down conversion. Penn State's had four opportunities, and South Florida's had nine. That's what those last three out of nine, they were able to convert into a touchdown, so you give yourself an extra set of downs every time you convert on third down. Third and one on the blitz, and I don't know, second effort. I still think that Hall is short of the first down marker, and Penn State looks like they stood the test. I'm impressed with Tim Shaw. The fine junior from Livonia, Michigan. Not a big guy, like 6'2", 222, but he knows how to fill a hole. He steps right up in there. He's one of the leaders on defense. Extremely strong and a fine academic All-American. And because of Dan Connor's impropriety, Shaw's had to move from the middle to the outside. Yeah, and he's, they're going to leave him out there, I believe. I think they're going to bring Dan They're going to move Shaw back to the inside, and they're going to put Connor on the outside when he does return. Now Baker to punt. Lowry at the 22. Run to the outside. Lowry had the kicker to beat and could not as Baker brings him down to save a touchdown. Tell you what, he could have went for a touchdown if number 13 would have turned up the field. Jay Alford, forget about go after the punter. Lowry's already by that defender is trying to chase him down, but I'm pretty impressed with Lowry. They got to set up in a right return got the whole sideline but watch number 13 as it comes in your picture he's looking back go forward if you go forward you got a touchdown yeah he had already passed Lowry was already well be beyond the guy that was chasing him from behind a 39 yard return though for Lowry to set Penn State up in bull territory at the 39 a fumble who's got it Hunt did not get the exchange from Robinson. And South Florida says it's their ball. We'll wait to see what the officials decide. I tell you, Penn State dodged a bullet there. They get a good punt return. You can't be like it is, but this is a fundamental mistake. I don't know if it's a quarterback's fault or running back's fault, but both should take responsibility. Looked like Tony Hunt got into the line of scrimmage and just dropped the ball. First game, or is that just bad play? I mean, it, it's just lack of focus. Lack of focus. I just think it fumbles are fundamental, especially when you don't have any contact coming your way. Certainly, the coaches aren't going to let you have first game jitters as an no, excuse. Not at all. Because they have them too. This time the exchange is pure, but again, no room for Tony Hunt. Bottled up inside Hunt. Average less than two yards per rush. Five attempts in the first half, only six yards rushing. Well, I'm impressed with South Florida coming out here in the second half defensively. Anytime Penn State goes to the three receivers, one tight end, one back in the backfield shotgun, 
to run that read option or that read zone inside with Michael Robinson. And the linebackers are attacking the line of scrimmage a lot more here in the second half. So oh, third and 14 now. Look for the option here. They got four receivers in the game. I don't they trust Robinson going on the field. Robinson to pass. Has time. Looking downfield right through the hands of Ethan Kilmer. Yeah, Ethan Kilmer didn't do himself justice there. You don't run with your hands out the last couple steps. You stride. You stride, stride, stride. Don't put your hands up until the last second. It slows him down just a half a second. And that causes an incompletion, which could have been a potentially big play. Could have been a touchdown. And Ethan Kilmer slippery in the secondary. How, do, how does the guy get that free on a third and 11 play? Third and 14, actually. Kapanos sends the punt towards Jackson. And it takes a great Penn State bounce and goes out of bounds at the four. Boy, you talk about pinning the Bulls back in their own end zone. It's Penn State by 10. As the One place where sports hottest athletes mix with the glamour of Hollywood. Hey, I'm Andy Roddick. Welcome to my party. ESPN Hollywood takes you inside the celebrity lives of sports top stars. I still got a lot of offers to do movies. The spotlight. It's almost like walking around with Brad Pitt. The sets. That's Reggie Jackson. The shoots. And everything Hollywood. David Beckham, he fit really nicely in Mysterio Lane. ESPN Hollywood. Weeknights at 6 p.m. Eastern on ESPN2. The top five reasons you can't blame the Atlanta Falcons for trading Brett Favre. Were they afraid he'd party his way out of the NFL? He should have been on the cast of Animal House. Did he brag too much for a rookie to all pro Chris Miller? Brett would go up and tell Chris, Chris, go in there and mess it up, baby. I'll be in there by the fourth quarter. And did he flop on the field? I can see why they made the trade. No one knew, including myself, what was to come. The top five reasons you can't blame the Atlanta Falcons for trading Brett Favre. 9 Eastern Monday on ESPN Classic. South Florida begins at their own four yard line. The crowd trying to help out this Nittany Lion defense. The give to Hall. Wow, what a hit. Tamba Holly. Tamba Holly did a nice job in an inside stunt. Takes a rip move with his right shoulder and just flies to the ball. He just crushed Andre Hall there. Holly and Hall is down. <laughs> Second and ten. That guy could play on Sunday. The senior. Falling backwards, though making the catch is S.J. Green. He gets it up to the ten-yard line. Tom Bahali, when you look at what he has overcome in his life, not just here at Penn State, but... He is from Liberia, a country that is still torn by a civil war. At the age of nine, he left his home country, joined his dad in Teaneck, New Jersey, where his dad teaches at Fairleigh Dickinson. His mom is still behind in Liberia and has very limited contact with her. He is hoping to become a U.S. citizen to try to get her out of Liberia. Paul looks like he stopped short of a first down. 
And it might be three and out for South Florida again. That's well, Tim Shaw knowing where your help is, attacking from the outside in, knowing that your help's on the inside. But USF is trying to get a first down there. They came out with a run. It was stopped by Tom Bahali. The quick hitch on the outside for a minimal gain. And then third down, Penn State gets them off the field. Tom Bradley's defense has really come out playing with a much more spirited effort, wouldn't you say, here in the second Absolutely. half? Absolutely. And, and, you know, you, you'll tell the character of your team what happens when you come out of the locker room. you got to match the same amount of intensity that you left the field with prior to the end of the half. Brandon Baker from his own goal line. He booms one out there. Lowry goes over his shoulder and Lowry will just let it go and it bounces down to the 20. Wow, what a punt for Brandon Baker. When you look at Joe Paterno and his legacy, I, I, it's impossible to really try to put it all in perspective. When he looks at it, it'd be interesting to see what he has to say about 40 years as a head coach at Penn State. I'm having a lot of fun doing what I'm doing, and uh, you know, I think the time will come, obviously, where I'm going to have to back away and say, hey, you know, hey, you've been at this thing 56, 58, 60 years, you know, you've lost your zest, you lost your ability, those kind of things. But I really don't have time to think about them. I, I'm just, you know, I'm very up, excited and, 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 and nervous about. Having a good football team this year. One thing you can say about Joe Paterno is he has not lost any zest at all. Now he's still getting a three point stance like we talked about earlier in the early spring and early fall camp. He was coaching positions, getting down there, showing good football technique. We saw him last night here at the pep rally. He knows how to get these fans fired up and countless dollars he's contributed back to this university. And they have a library named after him and a statue outside, and he's still alive. You know how many coaching changes there have been in Division One since he took over here in '66? <laughs> 765 coaching changes. Outside, Tony Hunt, his best run of the day. Johnny Jones perhaps saved a touchdown and forced Hunt out of bounds. Well, two adjustments that Penn State's offense has made since this half has started. Number one, throwing the ball to the outside to the quick hitch of Derek Williams. Number two, the pitch sweep out to the left side. You got Brandon Snow leading Hunt down the field, but that's the first time they really attacked the perimeter of the field. And they, they secured the end man in line of scrimmage, Smoke, Smoke Hole did. Allowed Hunt to get out there in open space. A 41 yard run. And that gets Hunt back on the positive side of the ledger. Robinson looking for Williams, and there's a flag. Trey Williams was up over the back. He doesn't like the call, but it'll be pass interference against South Florida. Well, Trey Williams, I thought, had good position in that play, and looked like Derek Williams initiated the, the contact. Good smarts in his part. We hear the call from Jim Lapatina. Best interference on a defense, number 21. 15 yard penalty from the previous spot. Automatic. First down. Going back to this pass here by Robinson, trying to get Derek Williams on a skinny post. He's having trouble making this throw. The ball is not really coming out there with much zip. But to me, that, that's a no call. That's a no call. I'd, I'd, I'd let that go, let the players play, but that back judge has a better vantage point. Well, that might have been warranted a call there, the extra push after the play. That was probably more penal than the pass interference. A fumble. Robinson kept it, but then lost it. Now a scramble for the ball. It's nice being down there at the bottom of that pile, pulling shoelaces and mouthpieces and face masks around just to get that football back in your hands. Tim Jones looks like he's recovered the fumble for South Florida. That's the third turnover for the Nittany Lions today. And he's had two of them, Michael Robinson. I can't emphasize enough the importance of taking care of the football once you break the line of scrimmage. These athletes are too good nowadays and they're taught to strip the football. And Michael Robinson has had the ball in his hands at least a dozen times 
you know, running that read option up inside or counter option up inside. Well, Robinson today, two fumbles and also an interception. So South Florida takes over again at their own 11. From the shotgun, Julmas. Looking way downfield, he's got his man right across the middle. The pass is caught by Cedric Hill as we send you back to Mike Gleason in the studio. Well, let's go down between the hedges now. Boise State in Georgia. Tony Taylor gets a pick. He was banged up last year. David Green's gone, but Shockley, he's there. All right, Georgia first. Seven zip over the Broncos. Boise State calling that maybe the biggest game in their history. First down. Here comes Hall. Cuts it back inside and picks up a couple. Taking you back to Michael Robinson fumble. I mean, it doesn't do much for your offense when you get some big plays, you get a penalty, get down there in good scoring conditions, and then you have a fumble come back. But opportunistic South Florida. Looks like this Pat Julmas has really settled in, Dave, nicely. And he's getting nice protection at the line of scrimmage. To look down the field to your primary and your secondary receiver. To be honest, he's getting more protection, better protection than Denson got early in the game. I agree. Second down, seven yards to go. Holly was coming from the outside, and that pass was knocked down by Alan Zemitis. Incomplete. Well, nice job by Tom Bahali on the outside forcing Julmas to turn up inside, but Alan Zemitis did a nice job deflecting that pass down. And we talked about the secondary in the open, the experience they have back there. And we, they've already made a major impact with Lowry and punt returns and Zemitis with a fumble recovery for a touchdown and Chris Harrell with an inter interception as well. So their secondary is accountable today. You could feel Levitt pleading his case. Hey, if you're going to call interference down there, right. why not on our team? Right. Again, plenty of time. Boy, good coverage. Chris Farrell was right there. I mean, you talk about shadowing the receiver, and that brings up fourth down. And a lot of viewers at home might be see, might see third and seven. Why are you throwing the ball three yards down the field? Well, there's an opportunity to catch and run after that, but Penn State defended that nicely. And that's why they're throwing the ball underneath because they're well covered downfield. You take your chances with athletes catching the ball and running after the catch. Baker is going to have to ice his leg after the game. <laughs> this is his sixth punt of the day. He hit a nice one last time. Boy, I should say, 69 yard punt his last time. And he booms another one. Lowry's got a back pedal all the way to his 12. Lowry trying to break it outside again. We've got a penalty flag down at the 34 yard line. Might have a holding call by the return team usually in that sideline in front of the Penn State's bench. The guys working on the flyer out there. It becomes a fight. Two guys going at it battling to cover the punt. Well, that time a 56 yard punt by Baker. Joe Paterno wondering what the penalty is going to be and how it will be enforced. You now Coach Paterno has had a lot of conversations with these officials and <laughs> I'm sure some days in Write a book on his memoirs from his conversations. Holding on the return team, number one. This penalty is going to be half the distance to the goal from where the kick ended. First down. So Penn State continues to lead by 10 and not a good sign for South Florida. Maybe some cramping for their leading rusher, Andre Hall. This season, catch all of the premier regional college football matchups only from ESPN+. Plus. Check the local listings for each Saturday's game and time in your area. ESPN Plus is the best source to follow your hometown team. It doesn't happen often, but every once in a while, we got rain delays. Tiger Woods is a career year for anybody. Go, go, go! Honey, I don't know. It could be one hour, it could be four. I just bought myself a digital camera. Did you? What do you do? You just hope it lets up?
is one place where sports hottest athletes mix with the glamour of Hollywood. Hey, I'm Andy Roddick. Welcome to my party. ESPN Hollywood takes you inside the celebrity lives of sports top stars. I still got a lot of offers to do movies. The spotlight. It's almost like walking around with Brad Pitt. The sets. That's Reggie Jackson. The shoots. And everything Hollywood. David Beckham, he fit really nicely in Mysterio Lane. ESPN Hollywood. Weeknights at 6 p.m. Eastern on ESPN2. Penn State leading by 10. How are you going to evaluate Mike Tomczak, Michael Robinson's performance so far today? A little inconsistent. Rather a lot of inconsistencies in his game. You know, first opportunity, we talked on, on the open, that's his time to shine. And the ball's been in his hands a number of times today, and he's got three turnovers, two fumbles, and one interception. That's not good production at the quarterback position. They're taught to control the football, be careful with it. But his rushing yards, he's getting a lot of touches with those inside zone reads. I think the best diet for him is a quick passing game and get the ball on the outside and some flip plays to hunt. After the holding call on the return, Penn State backed up to their own six, first and ten. Hunt scrambling ahead for a couple. He gets it up to around the seven or eight yard line. Yeah, whatever yardage Robinson comes up with on the positive side of the ledger, it's really negated by those three turnovers. Well, you, you stop your drives. You don't allow yourself an extra set of downs when you turn the football over, especially on your side of the field when you're going in for a touchdown. And I think when they go over the films tomorrow and, and Monday, they're going to realize that these are problems that they can correct. And that's the good side about it. So you take something positive, they can correct these mistakes by the quarterback position. From the eight, second and eight. Hunt and a little delay. Bulls his way up across the 10 up to the 14 where he is planted by Tim Jones. I remember talking to Tim Jones last year. He sat out last year with a red shirt year from Lakeland, Florida. He's a senior, and, and Coach Jim Levitt wanted him to bulk up a little bit and get ready for the Big East. Well, he's in the Big East now, and bam! Oh, that's Mr. Tim Jones. He's had a lot of time on the bench last year, and he wants he's pretty fresh. Hey, Mike, for future reference, just name the city. You don't have to say the state of Florida, because all but eight guys on this <laughs> South Florida team are from the state of Florida. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's doing a heck of a job recruiting Florida, isn't he, Coach exactly. Levitt? And boy, I should say. How many football players do they have in that yeah, state really. anyway? Robinson rolling out. Looking for that first down stick. I don't think he got it. Forced out of bounds at the 15 yard line. See when you have a few negative plays at the quarterback position whether it be a fumble or interception you become a little hesitant with the football because you got your offensive quarter coordinator and Galen Hall talking to you. You got Jake Paterno talking to you. And you got the boss, Joe Paterno, talk. Take care of the football. I mean, it's not that hard. You just tuck it underneath your rib cage. And granted, these players are hitting pretty hard out there, and the ball does spurt out. But if you just take care of the football, it makes the game a whole lot more manageable. Looks like they gave Robinson a really favorable spot here. They marked it up to the 16 yard line. He was reaching forward as he was going out of bounds. And of course, they'll mark it where the ball is when he goes out. That's very favorable, Dave, like you mentioned. He might have stuck the ball forward to cross that plane for the first down. Very smart and very smart on his part. And Levitt doesn't like that spot at all. But it results in a first down for the Nittany Lions. And they'll keep possession with the clock now moving under five minutes in the third quarter. Jim Levitt's trying to get a break. He's talking his way into a break here. He stay on those guys. They start to listen, listen after a while. Robinson finds a seam up the middle hangs on to the ball and gets it up to the 24 as we send you back to Mike Gleason in our studio. Well Dave and Mike uh, Boise State not taking care of the football down in Athens it can't turn the ball over against a good football team particularly when you're playing the uh, Georgia on the road down between the hedges. Shockley impressive here as a passer 14 nothing now dogs over the Bronx. Well, it's, it's happening all over the country people are putting the ball on the ground. You're, you're, you're Justin King on the, in the game right now on the left side. You might see the ball go his way. Remember, he ran for 61 yards on a reverse in the first half, and here he comes again. Well, he'll get the first down, but that's it. I really think they only have two plays in this offense for Justin King at this point, and they're both reverse right and reverse <laughs> left. You, they're not asking him to run down the field 
you know, he's already been there. He got a touchdown pass thrown on him late in the first or first half. He's had the ball in his hands twice. They're trying to get him some game experience, and Joe Paterno uncharacteristically doesn't play many freshmen, but he's got some great ones on his roster. Even more uncharacteristically for Joe Paterno, he let those freshmen talk. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. He did. They <laughs> talked to the media. They talked to boosters. Oh, my goodness. And that's a first in Penn State history. The ball intended for Lydell Sargent thrown out of bounds, incomplete. Yeah, you know, I like to see Penn State get back more to a toss sweep with Hunt or either Scott. It seems like they're pinning the end man in the line of scrimmage pretty well. And what South Florida is doing with their linebackers, they're going eight guys in the box. They're bringing a the strong safety up. Johnny Jones enforcing Michael Robinson to beat you with his arm. And talking to uh, Rick Kravitz, the defensive coordinator this week, he said, we don't know if we're going to go ahead and challenge him and try to make it, but as the game unfolds, we're bringing that eighth guy down in the box, number six, Johnny Jones. Quick pass, Derek Williams trying to shuffle his feet. And ended up getting about three or four on the play. Trey Williams brings him down. I tell you, those two Williams guys are having a battle out there. Yeah. Remember they had a pass interference a while ago. But that's a basic play, and Trey Williams knows when the ball's thrown his way, attack from the outside in. And when you attack from the outside in, you have help coming your way, and you can have a successful play on defense. But this guy's a player. They, they're looking for a guy to step up, and he's one of the guys that have stepped up today. Penn State facing third and seven. They're two of six on third down conversions today. State does a good job picking up the blitz. Robinson is hauled down by Patrick St. Louis. And he'll be well short of a first down. Give credit to South Florida. They're stringing that play out. They had great coverage in a tight end. He was trying to go to Isaac Smol Smolko, but he was well covered. But none of the receivers helped out Robinson as he was scrambling towards their sideline. Jim Levitt's fired up. They do a nice job. He's a special teams guru. He gets these guys going. They're going to go ahead and try to get, get a nice return here in this fourth down punt. Back to get it, Jackie Chambers. Jeremy Kapanos, the punter for Penn State. The wind has died down a little bit, but Kapanos still punting into the wind. Good punt into that wind. Chambers. Goes down about where he caught it at the 21 yard line. The great atmosphere here, State College, Beaver Stadium, Penn State leading by 10. This season, catch all of the premier regional college football matchups only from ESPN. Check the local listings for each Saturday's game and time in your area. season is back. Gear up for the gridiron with your favorite NFL and college football apparel at ESPNshop.com. You want it? We've got it. From clothes to cleats and everything in between. So as you get ready for the new season, gear up at ESPNshop.com or call 1-800-762-1701 for a free catalog. ESPN Fantasy Football is so easy to use. Yeah, and it doesn't require a major time commitment. And we love the camaraderie it engenders. The way we're talking is so weird. This room and our clothes. Brandy, Randy, Candy, I don't think we exist. What, what do, do you mean, mean, Sandy? I think we're just part of some guy's fantasy, and whoever he is, he obviously loves ESPN Fantasy Football, and we're just icing on the cake. Ooh, oh. there's cake? <sighs> ESPN Fantasy, Fantasy Football. Play for free at ESPN.com slash Fantasy Football. A great sportscaster once promised to tell it like it is. Not quite, because first you have to tell it like it was. Every weeknight, Classic Now will take breaking sports news and give it to you with a deep perspective and backstory from yesterday to today and back, all in one show. I'm Josh Elliott. Join me for Classic Now, where the past is always present. 7 and 11 p.m. every weeknight, only on ESPN Classic. If you don't have ESPN Classic, get Classic Now. In Pennsylvania, temperatures in the 70s. We welcome you to Beaver Stadium. Matt Rice has applied his trade. The senior 
right end for these Nittany Lions, stretching things out, and an art major to boot, and beautiful artwork done by Matt Rice. This is a, a painting that he did called Blueprint, Mike, and it's the uh, Penn State players huddling with the massive crowd here at Beaver Stadium looking on, and he says this is just something that has come naturally to him. Uh, he had to give up a lot of his extracurricular activity to complete that painting blueprint said I couldn't play Xbox I couldn't play PlayStation I couldn't watch TV I was working on this for several months well, he's using his mind and his hand a lot of guys here use their minds don't they certainly 74 percent graduation rate across the middle pass is caught by Jackie Chambers and a first down up to the 36 yard line as we send you back to our studio. Well, Dave, back in your neck of the woods, I know you're dying to stay on top of that Colorado State Colorado game. Rams getting it done through the air. Corey Sperry gets it down to the one yard line. He's down, and then Mike Bartz with the one yard touchdown reception. And Rams all over the buffs right now, Dave. <laughs> That's an interesting score there. Sonny Lubick's team is putting it to Gary Barnett's squad. We have a player here back at Beaver Stadium. Why it's so quiet. We have one of the Penn State players down on the field right at the 40 yard line. Several of the players have all of a sudden started to cramp. We saw Mike Rice over on the sideline jumping around trying to work out a cramp earlier. We saw Andre Hall. They were working out a cramp. And it looks like a, a similar type of situation as Jay Alford is getting stretched out and now he's limping off the field. Well it's early part of the season as we know but these guys are in peak performance but they're not used to playing a 60 game 60 minute game and your adrenaline flows your energy you got seven and a half eight pounds of equipment on and your body starts to shut down after a while if it doesn't get enough fluids. It looked like he was grabbing the back of his leg he might be cramping in that hamstring area first and ten for South Florida there comes Hall on around the far side he'll pick up around five as he goes out of bounds forced out by Tim Shaw but not before he gets to the 41 this offensive line for South Florida headed up by Johnny Miller the center number 61 has really got these guys coming off the ball I know it took a while in the first half to get it going but from a protection standpoint from an execution standpoint they're doing a nice job with these tackle traps for Andre Hall. They're doing a nice job in the pocket, allowing Julmas to have vision down the field. Tom Bradley was talking about his lack of depth on his defensive line. He really likes to rotate his big guys, and he's not able to do that as much. We'll tell you why after this play. Julmas, again, right through the hands of an intended receiver, Andre Hall. One of the reasons he can't do it Penn State the reason they can't rotate their big guys as much is they lost Levon Chisley to grades a fifth year senior he's done then they had a Monty Purcell transfer to Hawaii and Ed Johnson he was expelled from fall classes. Well that hurts your depth right there you lose three players and over the years the last four years they want to know why Penn State's been down from a win loss standpoints because they have had players that haven't played to, to their potential and or have left because of academic reasons or off the field problems so Tom Bradley stretching it right here. Play clock at five. Julmas takes the snap. Knocked out of there by Puzlunsny. But do we have a flag on the play. No we don't but that was a questionable call the back judge and Jim Leffitt's going after him again. But Paul Puzlunsny has done a nice job. All over the field. So fourth down. The nice thing about Puzlozny there, he didn't take his right hand, his free hand, and put it on the back of the receiver. When he does touch the back, the back judge is going, to hit, going ahead to throw the flag for a pass interference play. Another punt for Baker. Lowry backed up again. This one not as good. It goes off the side of his foot. And they're going to bring it up to the 35 yard line. There's another flag down, a holding call against South Florida. And I'm sure that one, Penn State will say, we'd rather take the spot from where Brandon Baker punted it out of bounds. Holding on a kicking team, number 16. Penalty's going to be declined. 
first down. Only a 23 yard punt. Hey, don't forget, join us next Saturday. We have great college football Saturday action when the Bearcats of Cincinnati travel right here to Happy Valley. They'll challenge these Nittany Lions. Kickoff Beaver Stadium is noon Eastern. Check your local listings for more information. The foot of Mount Nittany. This is nice country out here. I can see why Joe Paterno, after 40 years and 58 years here in coaching, there's no reason to leave this place. And his coaching staff, Dave, got a lot of longevity as well. No kiss, no question. A lot of these guys have been extremely loyal to Joe Paterno. So Michael Robinson starts Penn State's attack, their 35 yard line, and a gain of five. Pass completed to the outside to Tony Hunt. You, Tony, you look at Beaver yeah. Stadium, Mike, and this is a place that has really grown. I mean, really grown. It moved from the east side of campus in 1960, moved about a mile to the west side of campus. And when they literally moved it, the old stadium, they moved it brick by brick. And they brought it over here. And originally, it only had 46,284 seats. Seven expansions to now where it seats over 107,000. Williams does the wise thing, and after he muffed the toss, he just fell on the ball. Why well, put that on, on Michael Robinson there? The pitch relationship was way too close for them to have any execution. And also, Derek Williams, who's used to touching the football, I'm sure they repped this play a number of times in the spring, a number of times in the fall camp here. But, you know, it's a negative situation. They go first and 10, they get a pass to Hunt for six yards. Now they have a negative play coming to the end of the third quarter. So nothing doing for either club in that third quarter of play. The score remains 17-7 in favor of Joe Paterno's Nittany Lions. One of college football's most celebrated coaches. One of ESPNU's most insightful shows. Now they're joining forces. Coaching legend Lou Holtz joins ADT College Coaches Spotlight, covering the week that was and the week ahead in college football. I'm here because of the fans. With all the breakdowns and press conferences. There are no neutral observers on this game. Lou Holtz joins ADT College Coaches Spotlight, Tuesdays at a new time, 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. Eastern, only on ESPN News. College Game Day, built by the Home Depot, Saturdays, 10.30 a.m. Eastern on ESPN. Stephen A. Smith is talking to the biggest names in sports. Give it up. Allen Iverson. Some people get scared of who you are. I'm not perfect. Ron Artest. Why did you go into the crowd? I reacted before I thought. Drew Rosenhaus. Find one team that won't deal with me. Gary Sheffield. I'm very disgusted with the Yankees. Larry Brown. I got fired. That's the bottom line. Yeah. Quite frankly, with Stephen A. Smith. Weeknights at 6.30 Eastern on ESPN2. Is Derek G the best shortstop ever? Well, in the pantheon of Yankee shortstops, I definitely put him ahead of Scooter and Corsetti. Yeah, his limited power drags down his OPS a little, but he's still one of the most clutch hitters of all time. Whoa. He turns that mean 6-4-3, and he's got the soft hands of Hannes Wagner, and even Boston fans call him Captain Intangible. How do you know he has soft hands? Classic Men with host Josh Elliott, 7 and 11 p.m. every weeknight, only on ESPN Classic. If you don't have ESPN Classic, get Classic now. Please rise for our couple's first dance as husband and wife. Penn State leading by 10, and there's a face familiar to a lot of Nittany Lion fans. That's Mark Robinson, All-American safety from 
the class of 83 was on that national championship team in 82 and right now he's working as the analyst on the radio side for South Florida so Mike he's probably watching this game with mixed emotions, uh, mixed emotions here today uh, he's pulling for the, the Bulls no doubt about it but I saw him earlier looks pretty buff like he can still play and he had a lot of great tackles a lot of great games and he talked more about his experience as a student athlete here more than anything when we had a chance to chat. We saw the comparison of the numbers of the guys we talked about in our open Robinson and Hall this uh, third and nine Robinson eludes some pressure now looking for some room to run and doesn't really find enough. He gets up to the 40 he needed the 45. He stopped there by Ronnie McCullough short of the first down marker. You know I'm an all in favor of having a quarterback do some things because he's a special athlete special quarterback in those inside zone runs but they tried to get that middle screen up again well defended by South Florida but Michael Robinson is taking some hits. He's now, taking a lot of hits. Steven Nicholas is down on the ground and slow to get up for South Florida. He is their leading tackler and best linebacker. Well, it looks like he's okay now. No worse for the wear. Maybe just a little stinger there. He was able to contribute to the stop of Michael Robinson. Is it a fact, Mike, that maybe Robinson not seeing his receivers open? I mean, he seems to be pretty quick to run with the ball. Well, that last play, it was his middle screen set up, and South Florida did a nice job deciphering the screen, and they had Lyman downfield for Penn State, so I thought Robinson did a nice job of trying to make something positive out of, out of it. Otherwise, they would have had a penalty. Let's see if Kapanos can take advantage of the wind at his back the way Baker did. He does. Fair catch signal. Ball bounding for the end zone. Lowry can't save it. And the ball goes into the end zone. A touchback. And South Florida will start at their own 20 yard line. Once again, our hearts and our Certainly our thoughtful prayers go out to those people down in the south. And if you would like to contribute financially to the Hurricane Relief Fund, we certainly encourage you to do that. You can call 1-800-HELP-NOW. You see the Spanish number for those of you who are Spanish speaking. And if you'd like to go online and make a contribution, you can at www.redcross.org. Well, I got $100 worth of prayers going your way. I know that. Maybe 1,000. I'm with you. Inside handoff to Andre Hall and Penn State seems to have clogged up that inside. Remember that was kind of a big hole in that first half and Penn State's made that adjustment. Well they're getting better play our defensive two interior tackles Jim Shaw and Jay Alford. They're squeezing that a gap a lot better and allowing these linebackers to go ahead and fill that other gap. But I'm looking for Penn State's defense to create a turnover here. They were very turnover conscious in the first half but they have, haven't done anything to force a turnover here yet. You see the difference in rushing yards. Penn State's had a couple of big ones to contribute to their 161 yards today. And a little bit behind the intended receiver, Cedric Hill. Or excuse me, that's Johnny Payton. And it was behind him and incomplete. You know, Lawrence Dossie, the wide receiver coach for South Florida, I was talking to him before the game, and he has a half dozen receivers that are very qualified and very capable but if you don't give him an opportunity to catch the football and put it out in front that falls in the quarterback's shoulders so Lawrence Dawsey knows that these receivers have great potential but it, you got to throw it give him an opportunity to catch it because Johnny Payton could have ran for half an acre there if he caught it see Joe miss it's 11 for 23 third and 10 has time cross the middle he finds Peyton who has the first down up to the 33. See that's nice. It's nice to know that you can come back in a third down play. We threw him a poor ball on second down. The quarterback has great confidence in himself comes back to Johnny Peyton settles down in the zone 13 yard completion and makes it very easy. Football is an easy game when you can throw and complete it. Give him an opportunity. What, did you see the lane he had to throw. Well it's nice. That's what a quarterback should have and. Offensive line has done a nice job with Miller at center. Joel Miss, oh boy, a dangerous flip. That could be, that's an incomplete pass. That's a, a forward pass that's ruled incomplete. Well, Pat Joel Miss was hoping that Andre Hall would continue running towards the line of scrimmage. When you hesitate as a running back, 
kind of botches everything up and thankfully they have another down. You know, Julmas is doing his part. He's trusting the fact that Hall will be up there inside the hole and Hall hesitated for a second. And that made it more challenging for the pass to be completed. You can take a bit of a chance on that play because if it is incomplete it just goes as an incomplete forward pass not a fumble. Julmas pressured still able to get it away but short of the first down is Ruger Tim Shaw was able to stop him and the pressure came from Matt Rice. I'm getting more and more impressed with Pat Julmas. You know nice job by Matthew Rice coming up the field but Julmas knows where his receiver is. Nice athletic move. Makes it a little bit more manageable on third down. Third and six. Looks like Penn State's just going to rush with three guys here and play coverage. And a good recovery defensively. Alan Zamitis, Chris Harrell. Harrell was the one that was able to stop Andre Hall and stop any kind of momentum, and that'll bring out the punting unit. Well, good defense, defensive call by Tom Bradley. They rushed three, they dropped eight, but they sniffed out that screen again, which they had success with before. And Chris Harrell did a nice job sniffing it out and making a complete tackle. Well, you see Lowry back at his own 20 yard line. Baker's last punt only went 23 yards off the side of his foot. He has boomed a couple of long ones, but now punting into that wind. This one's a great punt into the wind. Lowry back to his own 10. Trying to get outside. Looked like he was pinned in, but a nice return of 11 yards up to the 21. And we'll take a timeout. The score the same as it was at halftime. 17-7, Penn State leading with 11-10 to go. One place where sports' hottest athletes mix with the glamour of Hollywood. Hey, I'm Andy Roddick. Welcome to my party. ESPN Hollywood takes you inside the celebrity lives of sports' top stars. Still got a lot of offers to do movies. The spotlight. It's almost like walking around with Brad Pitt. The sets. That's Reggie Jackson. The shoots. And everything Hollywood. David Beckham, he fit really nicely in Mysterio Lane. ESPN Hollywood. Weeknights at 6 p.m. Eastern on ESPN2. The top five reasons you can't blame the Atlanta Falcons for trading Brett Favre. Were they afraid he'd party his way out of the NFL? He should have been on the cast of Animal House. Did he brag too much for a rookie to all pro Chris Miller? Brett would go up and tell Chris, Chris, go in there and mess it up, baby. I'll be in there by the fourth quarter. And did he flop on the field? I can see why they made the trade. No one knew, including myself, what was to come. The top five reasons you can't blame the Atlanta Falcons for trading Brett Favre. 9 Eastern Monday on ESPN Classic. Captains of Penn State, I would say mixed reviews today for him. Yeah, mixed reviews and miscues, to be honest with you. This is something that the quarterback has to know that protecting the football, we've harped on it because he, he hasn't done a good job so far. But Jay Paterno, the quarterback coach, is going to get in the film room and emphasize how important it is for that little football to stay in our side of the field. Two fumbles by Robinson today and that interception you saw. 35 rushing yards, 90 passing yards. And those three turnovers have been really costly. Here comes Derek Williams. 
And he gets it up to the 26 yard line, a gain of five on first down. Looks like when Penn State goes to that outside to tackle run, whether it be a just a long sweep through the backfield through that spread formation or a toss sweep to Scott or Hunt, they've had great success. But South Florida is clouding that middle up pretty good and forcing him to go outside. And there's the backup quarterback, Anthony Morelli. One of the most highly touted recruits when he came aboard here at Penn State. I watched him play a number of times in high school at Penn Hills High School, and it came down to Pitt and Penn State, and that was a recruiting war, and Tom Bradley was in the midst of that. Different than Robinson, and that Robinson is an all-around athlete, can run and pass. Morelli is more a typical drop-back passer. And, and, and a, we don't and know a really how good, good one. Yeah, we don't know how really well he's going to do at this level because he hasn't seen much game time experience. And Coach Paternal, the first three weeks of the season, is usually when you get these younger players some experience. And you're hoping to have a lot more points on your side of the scoreboard. But with a 10-point game, number 14 is not going to see much action today. And it's depressing because you work all springtime, you work all fall camp, and you get ready for this big game, and there's an opportunity for you potentially to play, and it never flourishes because the game's too tight. You know, we talk a lot about this freshman class coming in for Penn State, but actually the coaches here are excited about their last two recruiting classes, and Morelli was a big part of that one last year. Derek Williams, obviously a big part of the one this year, along with Justin King and Lydell Sargent. They really went after speed with his last recruiting class, but Williams was really one of the key pieces, and when he made that when he made that decision it really gave this coaching staff a big uh, a big advantage and and where there's yeah. a D way there there D will I should say there is a way and that's D will Derek Williams and Joe Paterno I'm sorry Dave has really recommitted himself to recruiting I know last two years he's taken some emotional time to himself and his family but they're back on track now recruiting wise and the draw play Hunt. Hunt. Breaking a big one, could go all the way. Forced out at the five. Mike Jenkins came in to save a touchdown. Nice second effort there by Tony Hunt. That's probably the most impressive run he's had in a long time, but just a delayed draw. Missed tackle there by number 54, Pat St. Louis. And he gets in the open field, not a very fast runner, different style, more upright, but still, that was probably one of the bigger plays of the game, wouldn't you say, Dave? Absolutely. 68 yards on that run, and he's up over 100 now. Now it's up to South Florida to make a stand here. Don't give up. Go ahead and try to force him a field goal. First and goal at the four, Robinson, and the keeper touchdown! Robinson saying forget those turnovers there's six more well I'd be getting a lot of praise for that one but that was set up by Tony Hunt with that nice gallop 58 yards and Robinson executed that option play perfectly that's something that South Florida really hasn't seen much today and you get down inside the red zone people lose their responsibilities of who has the pitch and who has the quarterback and Robinson certainly took advantage of it but all the miscues the three or four miscues he's had today are nullified if Penn State is able to go ahead and put a few more points on the board. Blocked on the extra point try. And that will not add the point. So it's 23 7 as we had to break. A 79 yard drive that took only three plays. A big chunk from Tony Hunt and the rest, Michael Robinson. The top five reasons you can't blame the Atlanta Falcons for trading Brett Favre. Were they afraid he'd party his way out of the NFL? He should have been on the cast of Animal House. Did he brag too much for a rookie to all pro Chris Miller? Brett would go up and tell Chris, Chris, go in there and mess it up, baby. I'll be in there by the fourth quarter. And did he flop on the field? I can see why they made the trade. No one knew, including myself, what was to come. The top five reasons you can't blame the Atlanta Falcons for trading Brett Favre. 9 Eastern Monday on ESPN Classic. 
Clash returns to the Palace of Auburn Hills when Wichita State meets Michigan State on December 10th. For tickets, log on to palacenet.com or call 248-377-0100. It doesn't happen often, but every once in a while we got rain delays. Tiger Woods is a career year for anybody. Go, 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 go. Honey, I, I don't know. It could be one hour, it could be four. I just bought myself a digital camera. Did you? What do you do? He just hope it lets up. One place where sports' hottest athletes mix with the glamour of Hollywood. Hey, I'm Andy Roddick. Welcome to my party. ESPN Hollywood takes you inside the celebrity lives of sports' top stars. Still got a lot of offers to do movies. The spotlight. It's almost like walking around with Brad Pitt. The sets. That's Reggie Jackson. The shoots. And everything Hollywood. David Beckham, he fit really nicely in Mysterio Lane. ESPN Hollywood. Weeknights at 6 p.m. Eastern on ESPN2. Ray Hall getting stretched out on that South Florida sideline. They're experiencing some cramping here today, which is unusual because they were just featured on Good Morning America regarding cutting edge medical research for heat related illnesses. Well, nothing ill about Penn State right now as a three play drive. And of course, the key play was that 70 yard run from Tony Hunt. And Robinson took it four yards for the touchdown in a drive that lasted under one minute. Over end kick. Trey Williams. And a flag is down at the 30 yard line. And we'll see what the call is about as Williams brings it up to the 25. Holy on the return team, number 84. 10 yard penalty from the spot of the foul. First down. So that'll back up South Florida as if that's what they needed. Yeah. Already trailing 23 7 and going after a defense that hasn't given up more than 21 points in forever. Jim Levitt's team, though, I mean, this is, he isn't going to look at for any moral victories. I know that. But when you look at coming into Penn State, into this environment, and being within 10 after really dropping back early 17 nothing it's been a pretty pretty nice story for them today. All right, let's go to the studio Mike Gleason has an update and Dave once again we head west the BC BYU the Boston College on the board again when in doubt go to the big tight end Chris Miller 17 3 BC Colorado Colorado State buffs with some pride Hugh Charles with some speed and the Buffs trying to get back into it. It's 21-18. Rams on top by three. Dave? Well, we into a great game. So we'll see what happens between those two. That's bragging rights for that state, huh? Oh, yeah, big time. Second and six. Not much running inside this time. Because Matt Rice was there to stop any forward progress. Andre Hall who is just getting stretched out over on the sideline. Now Hall last year he was just used to 100 yard games. He had six of them last year to set a South Florida record plus his 1357 yards set a record plus his 11 rushing touchdown set a record plus his 6.5 <laughs> yards per carry set a record. Suffice it to say Hall's got the record book when it comes to rushing for the Bulls. Dulmas slips through and has a first down. He'll go out of bounds. Stops the clock at the 32 yard line from Beaver Stadium. 
in University Park, Pennsylvania. South Florida Penn State meeting for the very first time today. Mike Tomzak is here. So is yours truly, Dave Armstrong. Glad to have you along. And 99,000, just shy of 100,000 on hand here today. And it might be a, a bit of a statement by some of these fans saying we're not going to sell out that opener. You got to start doing better than four and seven. Or maybe the students just took some extra time in Joe Paterno Library and got an early start in classes. Oh, I'm sure that was it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Pass is completed. Good for it's like Carlton Hill. Eight yards. Carlton Hill with the catch. Looks like with Hill, they're trying to do almost the same thing Penn State is trying to do with Williams and King. Just get him the ball and see what they can create. Absolutely. I mean, they're playmakers. He made so many plays at the quarterback position throughout his high school career. And when you get to that next level, it's a little bit faster. But these athletes adapt, and it's a nice thing that Levitt's doing with Hill getting him into the lineup. Remember, South Florida came on strong at the end of the first half. Another first down. Andre Hall takes it close to midfield up to the 49 yard line. He's a powerful runner. He took Tim Shaw for a ride there after initial contact. You know, these little running backs that do a nice job hiding behind the line of scrimmage and getting that little burst into that next level. And he's a hard worker in the weight room. I know that. Hard worker in the chess room, too. Mm. Very good chess player. Hill on the reverse and Penn State snuffed it out and now we're going to have a penalty. Like you mentioned Dave they're trying to get the ball to Hill as this game gets longer. A few more touches is going to allow him a little bit more experience. Penn State's going to refuse the penalty. It's called against South Florida because Penn State stopped the play and yeah, the legal procedure. They had to the wide out on the offense. Number eight and two. Two men were moving. One did not come to a stop and set for a second. Penalty going to be declined. Second down. It's a loss of three on the play, so second down and 13 yards to go. Kind of surprised here that USF is not really going to a hurry up offense. You know, they got the ball with 10 minutes and 10 seconds left, and we're already three minutes into it, and they haven't crossed the halfway mark yet. Wilmus trips up, might have lost another yard. Back to the 45. They're going the wrong direction. Scott Paxson was able to force him down. Well, nice pressure up inside, but more, even better in the secondary. This talented secondary did a nice job passing off receivers as they were coming in zones and I know Calvin Lowry was happy for that sack because he's doing a lot of duty back there to free safety as well as the punt returns and a little bit winded as the game gets longer. So now third and 13 for South Florida. Jewel miss. A uh, completed pass on the far side to S.J. Green, and he scrambles forward for the first down up to the Penn State 41. Well, if that was not a completion, I would have been upset with S.J. Green. He kind of stood there and didn't attack the ball, but he was able to get that first down. As you see at the top of your screen, once he stems up to the top, he sits right there, come back, but he knows where the first down marker is. He slips a tackle from Zemitis and is able to continue his drive. Big third down play there for South Florida. So they keep this drive alive. Gulmas dumps it off to Hall. Hall has some room. He'll get at least 10. Let's see where they mark it. They're going to mark it down right at the 28 yard line, it looks like. Another first down for South Florida. Andre Hall, we mentioned a chess player. He was playing. Juco and he was in Garden City to play a game and they were having a chess tournament at the hotel where the team was staying and coach said all right it's Friday night go ahead and enter the chess tournament if you'd like he did and the grand prize was you get to play chess against Jim Brown yeah that's what? Jim Brown 
Yeah, the, the Hall of Famer. Yeah, the Hall of Fame running back. And so Hall played chess against Jim Brown and beat him. <laughs> and that's something to tell the grandkids. I mean, what are the chances you're going to play Jim Brown in chess in Garden City, Kansas? Well, if you live long enough, you'll have many opportunities to do a lot of things. And <laughs> yes. I know reading that article and Andre Hall, his favorite piece on the board is that shining knight because he can go forward, sideways, just like a running back. Scott Paxson was shaken up on that last play. He's okay. First and ten for the Bulls at the 28. Ball stop for a loss of three. Boy, good tackle inside by Chris Harrell. Well, he he was unaccountable for. They brought him up. They brought him up on the right side of your picture. Nobody blocks him. That's the way a tackle should be made. With your hips driving through his numbers, wrapping that one year layoff. Didn't hurt this guy. Not at all. Harrell came in tied with Puzlowski, Puzlowski, I should say, as the uh, career leading tackler, current leading tackler. 140 tackles coming into this game for their careers. Ali was putting some pressure on. The pass is completed to Hall. He goes out of bounds at the 30 yard line, but it's going to bring up third and long again. I'll tell you, you got third and 13 here. You get half of it back. We're in four down territory. If I'm a South Florida coach, you got to convert on third down here. If not, try to get half of it back and go for it on fourth down because time is not on your side anymore when you're down by 16 points. Levitt's Bulls are just six of 17 third down conversions today. Remember, they went until late into the second quarter without a first down. Jewel Miss given time again finds that seam across the middle. Zamitis makes the stop, but not before Johnny Payton makes yet another catch and they'll move the chains one more time. He's got the sweetest hands in the team. You people at home, watch this guy catch it with his hands away from his body. Boom. Like a web. I think some of those other receivers should look at that highlight for South Florida. And they haven't dropped many passes in the second half, and they kind of got out of that funk after the first quarter. But converting on third down there allows them another set of downs. This is the 13th play of this drive. Looks like a busted play. Jewel miss though turns it into some positive yards as he goes down to the 14. Yeah. Matthew Rice turned it into a busted play. Number 55. He got penetration up the field. But Jewel must did a nice thing by turning up inside. Keeping it very manageable. And they still got three timeouts left, South Florida. So a quick score here. I don't know if you want to go for an onside kick or not, but you know, they got to score rather quickly here, Dave. Right, Rice wind. It looks like he's painting the sidelines right now. Second and seven. Good catch. And finally out of bounds at the six yard line. The catch made by Jackie Chambers. Puzlesny forced him out of bounds. That's great awareness by Chambers. On the sidelines, Julmas comes out, sprints left a little bit. Know where you are in the field. Most receivers settle down two yards before the sideline, gather himself, and go ahead and get the first down. Nice awareness. Saw the fumble that goes out of bounds, but now first and goal for the Bulls from the six. An impressive drive that started at their own 15 yard line. Where's Johnny Payton? He's up top. Watch that fade route. Ted Hall tries to bust through the middle. Nothing doing. That's not going to get you anywhere, gentlemen. You know, Rod Smith is a well-versed offensive coordinator. He put this system in five years ago. Now it's elevated to the offensive coordinator spot, but I would disagree with that call. I want to go into the end zone or at least get Julmas on the perimeter because we're going to be inside of three minutes, two and a half, before it's all said and done, either a touchdown or a field goal. Another run. Hall forced out at the three yard line. 
Alan Zemitis able to force him out, keep him out of the end zone. Now third and goal from the three. Yeah, I thought Jumas could attack that defensive end a little bit more. Tamba Hali. But he did his part, put the ball in number two's hands. I'll do the same thing. He's a lot better athlete than I am. Zemitis did a good job of fighting the block of S.J. Green to make that stop. You know, as you look at the Big East, where University of South Florida has entered into, as physical as the Big Ten is, and here's a nice taste. I thought USF has answered the call a number of times today, but they were able not to put the ball in the end zone. Here's some of the new teams in the Big East. Louisville is going to be a powerhouse in that league right away. Of course, Pittsburgh is there. Cincinnati joins South Florida and Louisville as the newest members of the Big East Conference. And the Pitt Panthers played South Florida last year, so they're familiar with each other. I know the team to beat in this conference this year is going to be Louisville, and I think Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. I got to call Pittsburgh. They won the Big East last year. Got that BCS bowl facing Utah. And that's the exciting thing about USF is they have an opportunity for a BCS ball game. And, mm -hmm. you know, Jim Levitt got that in his vision. And you know a guy that has a vision like Jim Levitt, he'll get it done. And they may be a year or two away as far as getting their program up to speed for a conference like the Big East. But they're not that far away after what we've witnessed here today. The pass ruled incomplete. Tim Shaw was able to tip it out. I think it's I think it was Scott Paxson that go ahead went ahead and deflected that at the line of scrimmage, either him or Jay Alford. But you had Chambers coming in from the left side. It was Tom Bahali. Ali. Nice. Nice. And I was talking to Tom Bradley about Tom Bahali. He's only 6'3, 287, I believe, but his wingspan isn't as big as you would think it would be. His arms look so long from up here, but that's one knock on him when he goes to that next level. But that guy's got a motor and he plays hard. He sure does. So South Florida takes a timeout. Looks like they might want to go for it here on fourth and goal from the four yard line. You know, this is a debate that you and I have all the time, Dave. You know, we were watching a game the other night and I think it was Central Florida had an opportunity. They were down by, I think, eight points, and they needed to kick a field goal or a touchdown. They went for it on fourth down, and it was incomplete, and the game was over. Here's an opportunity for South Florida to think about this. Maybe kick it here. Get it to 23 to 10 and go for an onside kick. Yeah, it's but if they get two eight-point scores, they tie the game. Well, it's very debatable. We could sit here and go back and forth, but the quicker you score, the quicker the opportunity you have from a time standpoint to do an onside kick. Or recover, you know, something down the field through a fumble if you decide to kick it into the end zone. Yeah, but here on fourth down, it's not going to save you any time to kick a field goal as opposed to going for it. I mean, a matter of a second or two, and that's about it. I, I mean, I, I I appreciate South Florida going ahead and going for it here, because then, but the, if they go and they score, they've got to go for the two-point conversion because they need two eight-point scores just to tie the game. If this is their strategy to go for a touchdown here, what they're playing for is two scores, not three. Well, a lot of times coaches get so inundated with so much information that these common things like this are no brainer. If we're going to win this game, we're going to win it on fourth down and give us itself an opportunity to go ahead with an onside kick. That's what they did last year. Eight for 15 on fourth down. Here comes the blitz. And they go back to that same play that got the touchdown in the first half, and it's another one to Johnny Payton. That's a good blink. I don't know what Anwar Phillips was doing there, but he kind of lulled him to sleep. Johnny, Johnny Payton did. It's a backyard play. You know, the unfortunate thing is there's 10 other guys in a defense that can't do anything to prevent that play from happening because you're one on one on the outside. And Payton does that so well. I guess he and Jewel, Jewel Miss is doing a nice job in practice. And yes. Well, my math is bad, too. I mean, even with. Well, no, a two-point conversion here gets them within eight. You're Correct. right. I was, my math was right the first time. So they've got to have the two-point conversion here to get within another score and another two-point conversion. So that's what they have to go for. Again, they roll the dice. Instead of going for the field goal and three scores, they're hoping to do it in two, but all of these plays are do or die for them. And a flag is down. The pass incomplete, but a flag is thrown on the sideline.
Legal formation on the offense. Only six men on line of scrimmage with the snap. The penalty can decline. PAT is no good. So now South Florida still needs two more scores here today. Jim Levitt's team gets the touchdown, but not the much needed two point conversion. Two touchdowns to Peyton, but it might be too few. This guy just went to five bowl games in one week. Of course, he forgot his sunscreen for the first two. He lost his voice by the fourth game. And the worst part of all is his girlfriend dumped him when he got back because he didn't tell her he was going in the first place. So tell me, was it worth it? Oh, yeah. Enter to win Cooper Tire's Ultimate Bowl Tour, and you and three friends could be headed to five bowl games in one week on a private jet. Go to a Cooper dealer near you or visit ultimatebowltour.com to enter. <laughs> Who knows? This could be you. One place where sports' hottest athletes mix with the glamour of Hollywood. Hey, I'm Andy Roddick. Welcome to my party. ESPN Hollywood takes you inside the celebrity lives of sports' top stars. Still got a lot of offers to do movies. The spotlight. It's almost like walking around with Brad Pitt. The sets. That's Reggie Jackson. The shoots. And everything Hollywood. David Beckham, he fit really nicely in Mysterio Lane. ESPN Hollywood. Weeknights at 6 p.m. Eastern on ESPN2. Two touchdowns from South Florida belong to Johnny Payton in on almost identical plays. Identical plays. He did a nice job stemming inside on Anwar Phillips just to freeze him. And I thought Anwar Phillips was in a position to make a play, but it almost looks as if he didn't really attack the receiver once the ball was in the air. And right there, he got a burst. Even try to get a pass interference call or something to negate that touchdown, but give credit to Johnny Payton. Making the two receptions today for touchdowns. And again in college, one foot in is good. A drive that lasted 18 plays, chewed up seven minutes and 14 seconds, and traveled 85 yards for the touchdown. Now South Florida's hope here is an onside kick and a quick recovery, but again by that failed two-point conversion. They're really up against it now with under three minutes to go. Most exciting play in football, onside kick. Coming to the near side. And it's, I don't know, recovered, I think, by South Florida. Nope, they're going to give it to Penn State. Look at Jim Levitt. Who recovered that for them, for Penn State? It looked like Adam Sank was the one going for the ball, crawling on his belly after it. I don't know if he's the one that ultimately came up with it. Jim Levitt is beside himself. Is that Kilmer? Number 43. Again, most exciting play in football. You can't practice this live because too many guys get hurt, but it's perfectly executed. That is Ethan Kilmer, isn't it? Yeah, it is. You're right. It's 43. And nothing more frustrating for a coach. The ball's laying there for, it seems like, eternity. And they had every opportunity to recover this. Right South there. Florida. Right there they had it. Keep scrambling. Keep scrambling. Nice job by e oh, Ethan grabbed it back. And that's what Levitt saw. South Florida's got the ball. But instead, they give it to Ethan Kilmer. I'd like to have some of these guys come off the sideline and grab some of those Penn State guys right there. Grab 43's ankles and pull them off the sideline. <laughs> exactly. Jim Levitt's the type of guy that wants to get out there, and, but to no avail. Penn State's ball.
Now whistle stop the play. Penn State is going to try to get that clock moving and keep it moving. Jim Levitt's team came in here, a pretty decided underdog. Well, the timeout was taken. Well, he's taking a timeout so he can have a commun communication with the uh, side judge here, field judge actually. Sir, you missed that call. I was right there. <laughs> you got to be kidding me, he's saying. This is unbelievable. He, he's been lobbying all game long for a call, and that was the one time he had an opportunity. And have you guys ever been a head coach in the Division One football? Have you guys ever had to be in my position? Can you guys make a call for me, please? I mean, there's so much dialogue that goes on, but these officials are unflappable. He has had a running conversation with that field judge pretty much all day. Joe Paterno on the other sideline giving his final instructions to Michael Robinson and I'm sure his final words to Robinson were don't lose the football. Well they have two scenarios they have that two minute drill when time gets below two minutes you're trying to hurry up your offense and they have the three minute drill which is predominantly a smash mouth football type of execution where they get you know their bulk of plays or daily dozen or half dozen plays and they just rep them rep them rep them. And they don't let the defense get the ball back by just continuing to make first downs. Here comes Williams. They give it and set inside. Some good hard running by Tony Hunt. Hunt's having himself an impressive day now. Of course, that big 70 yard run today helps things out dramatically. This is after he had only six yards in the first half. Yeah, and he, he has good vision. He has good, you know, the play was meant to go on the strong side. He saw a crease on the right side. And that's what you want in your running back. You want him to have that 180 degree vision where he could see over his shoulder. And once you get to that next level, positive yards and get down. Clock moving near two minutes. Hunt again wants to stay in bounds and will gets it inside the 30 down to the 26 or 27 yard line. Nice gain on first down. You know, here's an opportunity for Penn State's offense to really build on something here. They're going to get nine guys up at the line of scrimmage because Penn State has two tight ends in the game and one receiver. And when you get those safeties up there, if you break one crease, you're hitting that yellow stripe pretty quickly if you're running back. And they're willing to take some chances, South Florida. They're trying to get the ball back, and at this juncture of the game, why not bring all nine guys into the box and try to commit some type of turnover? A lot of movement. I don't think this is going to go against Brandon Snow, the fullback. Prior to the snap, I'll start. Offense, number 30. Five yard per penny in the previous spot. Still second down. And next week, these Nittany Lions will take on Cincinnati in a game many of you will see, then Central Michigan. And they start Big Ten play at Northwestern. Northwestern had an impressive win today. Well, they got an impressive quarterback there in Brett Bazinet, who's going to his senior season. That's a tough game on the road. I know they, their big win last year was at, against Ohio State at Northwestern. It's a tough environment. Coach Walker's done a nice job there. And then Minnesota had a pretty convincing win. And then they played a team, one of the top teams in the Big Ten, Ohio State and Michigan in consecutive weeks. Minnesota's had Penn State's number the last few years. Hunt again. Fighting for a few more yards. Finally stood up the 26-yard line. And there's that rugby scrum that some of the Englanders are familiar with and that's just nice extra effort by your lineman coming in there after a hard day's work helping your running back out get a few more yards and move some time in that clock. Well, I guess ultimately when you assess the quarterback's play who's pretty much a spotlight guy and Michael Robinson a lot of room for improvement for him wouldn't you say Dave. Absolutely. And this is a good test for him. This yep. is his time to shine. He had a pretty good, pretty good game, but he had some errant mistakes that cost his team some opportunities to really put this game out of reach. Any coach will tell you they love to get that first one out of the way, though. It gives them a baseline for the season. Now they get into their regular routine, and it makes it a lot easier to prepare week to week. Exactly. And, you know, plus with school starting this, this, this past Tuesday, 
you know, kids got to get acclimated to the campus scene again, and then you got your two a days, and before too long, the second week will be pretty relaxing for them, but we got a pretty good opponent coming in here next week. Certainly in do. Cincinnati. It. So I think Joe Paterno will smile. It's a victory, another opening day victory for him. But he's never happy unless they win all their ball games. And I just um, I just like being around this guy, don't you, Dave? Absolutely. I mean, he just has tremendous charisma. And we talked about everything he's done for this football program, but you know, throughout the state of Pennsylvania and you know, he's like the guy that starts that ripple effect with the student athletes that go on and graduate and become greater men and they influence people's lives. And he teaches them a little bit about life because once they leave here, very few guys get the chance to play in the next level in the NFL. And a matter of fact, last year, they had nobody drafted in National Football League first time under his tutelage. After graduating from Brown, he almost went to law school. <laughs> but he was persuaded to become a coach and has become one of the greatest coaches in the history of college football. It'll yeah. be a first down for Penn State. By the way, uh, football started here at Penn State in 1887, and no, Joe wasn't around then. Uh, <laughs> it's the 119th year of Nittany Lion football. I'm glad to be a part of it, and I'm sure you are too, and our staff that have been working diligently in the truck. It's our first game this season, so. It's a lot of fun. I don't think uh, we have many miscues there, Coach. Not, not a bad debut. We've got to look at the tape though and get better. First and 10 here, and now they're just going to stall the clock out. South Florida has one timeout, but they're not going to use it. And this well, game they is. Got, they got to regroup. They got a tough schedule on the road this year, South Florida. Yeah, I should say so. Now they do go home against Florida AM and Central Florida, South Florida. They go to Jim Miami. I know that, they go to Miami. They're not going to be happy about the outcome of this game. But in the final analysis, when they got down 17 nothing early, this game could have turned into a rout. They made some adjustments. They started to attack Penn State where it looked like they had a weakness on defense. And you have to say that South Florida toned themselves and to lose by only 10 here at Penn State is pretty impressive. And I think South Florida's finally found themselves another quarterback in Pat Julmas who started all of last year. And his confidence is really taking another step in the right direction for his ball club. So Joe Paterno and his Nittany Lions able to win here today and uh, they continue to win. In fact they've won now 13 of their last 14 openers and they have won four straight. So Joe Paterno's Nittany Lions run off this field at Beaver Field. The final score Penn State 23 South Florida 13. Mike and I will be back here momentarily where Penn State wins it by 10. The first Saturday of the college football season, an adventure for teams in the top 10. Adrian Peterson and the Sooners feel the sharp horns of the Horned Frogs. A day at the beach for the two-time reigning champs. How Hawaii got Matt Leiner, Reggie Bush, and the Trojans off to a slow start. But boy, when they got on the field, they were on the field. New coaches in new places. Big time pressure to succeed. Charlie Weiss with the Fighting Irish and the Urban Renewal Project takes off in the swamp. We'll let the highlights wash over you. Get you ready for the Knowles and the Canes. It's all on College Game Day Final. Powered by Pontiac right now. College Game Day Final. Powered by Pontiac. You know what the best thing about the first Saturday in the college football season is? What? Since it's Labor Day weekend, we've got more college football coming on Sunday and right. Monday. That's great. What a day it was. College game day finals rolling. Reese Davis, Trev Alberts, and Mark May. What is it I always say about the early season polls? They are what? Fluid. Fluid. They're fluid sometimes because unranked teams knock off highly ranked teams. Plenty of that and plenty of threats of that going on. But let's tee it up for the opening kickoff. One team which had no such trouble, the USC Trojans taking on Hawaii. Reggie Bush. Over 250 all-purpose yards, including this nifty run here. Scored a couple of touchdowns. SC blew out Hawaii. 
Speaking of running backs of the big day, how about Brian Calhoun of Wisconsin transfer from Colorado? Shootout against Omar Jacobs in Bowling Green. Calhoun got five touchdowns. Great job. Look at Matt Bernstein there, the fullback, getting a nice block. Huge day for Brian Calhoun. Boise State. Boise State just melted down early against Georgia. Six turnovers in the first half. Jared Zabransky throwing it right to a wide open Trey Battle, but he's on scholarship with Georgia. And Rutgers, Brian Leonard up and over. Yamo be there. He went 83 yards, but Rutgers had a that's why your son's moment in the fourth quarter and let one get away to the Zookers. We will document all of that. That's a great move by Leonard. The game of the day, Texas Christian and Oklahoma. Bob Stoops has been at OU, never lost a game before October. Second quarter, Ty Gunn using his gun and finding Derek Moore. Great job feeling the pressure, keeps his poise, moves up, finds the open guy, touchdown TCU. 10-0 game in the second quarter, and the Frogs were swarming over Adrian Peterson, held him to five yards rushing in the first half. OU failed to scratch in the first half, but second half. And this is the Adrian Peterson we expect to see. Takes the ball, makes the cut to the right side, goes untouched into the end zone. TCU still leads 10-7. to And just when you thought the Sooners were about to take over AD, Comes up a little gimpy here. Helped off the field with a high ankle sprain. He did return later on in the afternoon, but even his return really couldn't spark the Sooners. 10-10 game in the fourth. Gun, Robert Merrill, option. Beautifully done. TCU up 17-10. And now Paul Thompson, one of two quarterbacks that Stoops tried to get the offense going. Sack, Horned Frogs take over on downs. Burn out the clock. And with that, Gary Patterson rolls into Norman. 17 to 10, TCU beats Oklahoma. First time Stoops has lost in September. It's also the first win over a top 10 team for TCU since they beat number one Texas in 1961. Quite a while ago, big landmark day for the Horned Frogs and the reason they did it was a much improved defense. A defense that quite frankly was awful last year ranked 99th overall terrible pass defense but in this game held OU to under 100 yards rushing shutting down the great Adrian Peterson who went for 1900 plus last year forced four turnovers 225 total yards and harassed Rhett Bomar and Paul Thompson throughout the day so Oklahoma's offense was inept against the TCU defense that's well and good and we can talk about inspired efforts and all of that but how the TCU get it done. Well, you know, Gary Patterson runs this kind of unorthodox 4-2-5 defense where you have four guys up front, two linebackers, and five in the defensive secondary, and it's these interchangeable parts. So what you have is you have these five guys. One guy can be a corner one play, safety the next play. You never know how to account for these guys. Problem is, when you're playing a quarterback like Paul Thompson with no experience, he's not sure who's what. That's when you get the turnovers. If you have an experienced quarterback who's able to figure out who's what, you can find those mismatches. So today, I think the inexperienced market quarterback for Oklahoma was exposed in the fact that they turned the ball over and they played uninspired. But you know what? If you're an Oklahoma fan, it's not over. You can still win the Big 12. You can still play in a BCS game. But what Gary Patterson was able to do is to make the Oklahoma offense one-dimensional and shut that down. What they did is they put eight men in the box. And this is what a lot of opponents are going to do when you have inexperienced quarterbacks. You put eight people in a condensed area. That means if you're going to try to run the ball, it's very difficult. You don't have enough blockers on offense to block everybody. If you get penetration in the backfield, you make the running back go east and west. That's what TCU was able to do. That's what most teams are going to do to Oklahoma this year because the best player on their offense is Adrian Peterson. But the problem with Oklahoma's offense, he only touched the ball eight rushes in the first half. If he's your best player, you've got to feed him the football. He should have carried the ball in the first half minimum 15 times. If I'm calling plays for Oklahoma, he's carrying that rock 15 times in the first half. This is what we do best. If you can stop him, you stop Oklahoma. You know, I think you hit it right on the head, too. It's still early. The, the sky's not falling exactly. in Norman right now. But it's a low ceiling. <laughs> it's a little bit lower than you might have expected because ceiling? their excellence has been so sustained, but you might have seen a little bit of an uneven start coming. If you look at that depth chart, depending on the positions, 25 to 27 freshmen and sophomores on there. Not a lot of experience at some positions for Oklahoma. Chris Fowler and the guys saw Pittsburgh and Notre Dame, but everything sort of dwarfed by this upset that TCU pulled against Oklahoma. Oklahoma, Chris. Yeah, guys, we didn't see this one coming. And in Vegas terms, it's one of the biggest upsets in the last decade. Bob Soups has never had a loss like this at Oklahoma. He was 19-0 in September. His team scores 10 points against the defense that a year ago was dead last in the country. 
against the pass. And they've had quarterback transitions before. Josh Heupel, Jason White came in with no experience. They didn't have a running game to lean on in those years either, but they played a lot better than Thompson was able to. There are other problems, obviously. Yeah, there are, and the guys touched on a lot of them. I think when you have a team that can't stretch the field vertically, the defense is allowed to put eight or nine guys up at the line of scrimmage, and I don't care how good Adrian Peterson is, you can't run into a nine-man front and continue to have success. It's going to be a long season if you try to do that. The inconsistency in the, in the, from the quarterback position, I think, had a lot to do with not only the, the youth and the inexperience at that position, but I think the offensive line being banged up. Remember, this is an, this is an offense that lost their quarterback, their two best linemen, their top three receivers, nine new starters on defense. The biggest concern Bob Stoops has yep. is not just that the quarterbacks didn't yep. play well. Where is the leadership? Where's the passion? When the sink, when the ship yeah. was going down, nobody picked them up and played with any passion. Well, I tell the guys in Bristol, I think the sky is falling and it started to fall against USC in the Orange Bowl. They quit against Southern California last year, and no, and uh, Oklahoma hasn't been the same since. I know it's the first game, but they lost swagger. They got out hit. That's not Oklahoma football. That, what I saw was not Oklahoma football. Well, what, what is your definition of the sky falling? They lose at UCLA in a couple of weeks here. Yes, they lose sir. to Texas. They, they could do, and you got it. Four right or five there. losses all of a sudden. Exactly. All right. That's possible. That would be the sky falling in Norman by the standards they've set, the lofty right. standards. I'm telling you. Meanwhile, the game we watched here, the quarterbacks came in experienced. The head coaches, of course, were new. Weiss and Wanstad back at their alma maters. And suddenly, nobody at the Notre Dame Nation is regretting Urban Meyer's decision to pass on South Bend and head down to Gaines. They are ecstatic with Charlie Weiss. All of a sudden, they don't fear Michigan or USC or Tennessee or anybody on that schedule. For the Wanstead uh, administration here, now some of the enthusiasm certainly punctured as the Irish came in here and, and clocked them, put 500-plus yards on that Pittsburgh defense. Weiss coming out. Up to the challenge of Wanstead's defense to do it, handled them pretty well by comparison when they hooked up in the NFL. Now, after the Irish fell down 7 zip and a Palco touchdown pass to open the game, Darius Walker gets loose on the screen. I think this was the drive of the game. Pitt playing at home with the Charlie Weiss here beginning for Notre Dame, took control at the very start of the game. Notre Dame needed something, and they answered right after that with a big touchdown. Quinn made a rare mistake, and it was a pick, and it set up a field goal. Pitt took the lead, but then Notre Dame answered right back. The only team to stop Notre Dame in the first half was Notre Dame. They had one interception. They scored every other time. They looked good up front. You Woo. can see Rashawn Powers, Neal, muscling right up the middle for a touchdown. Weiss took great pleasure in that. He wanted to make a statement against the Pittsburgh defense. He didn't see a lot of passing in the highlights, but Quinn was very, very efficient. They kind of took the foot off the gas in the second half after scoring 35 in the first half. Wow, this is a football team that came in with a great deal of confidence and Charlie Weiss, his system, and I think all, as I said this morning, all the, the people that were doubting them and people that were questioning them and wondering what kind of team they had, I know for a fact that Charlie Weiss used that as motivation to get his team ready. You can see the comparison. Last year's Irish offense on the right, that buck 27 rushing per game was a low since World War II. Totally controlled the line of scrimmage. 275 rushing yards. A lot of those piled up after when it had success throwing the football. So it's only one game. You did say mm, 15 and a half hours ago on college game day that they'd averaged 30 points in this first six against the tough schedule. You going to revise that upward now? I, 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 no, I'm going to stay at 30. <laughs> okay, I think okay. 30 still is uh, going to be a, a difficult thing for them to be able to achieve. The, the thing that uh, we saw tonight is the play calling and, and the fact that when you give Charlie Weiss an opportunity to game plan and also call the game throughout the entire ball game, you see a coach that is a, one or two plays ahead of the play that's going on, and you have a quarterback that understands the scheme. Going to Ann Arbor is going to be a challenge for the Irish. Just because they look great against Pittsburgh, it's not time to throw away the schedule and think, oh, they're on their way to nine or ten wins. There's still issues. There's still questions. They still need to eat up as much clock as possible when they go up against a team that can throw the football, as in Chad Henney, Jason Avant, Steve Breston up in Ann Arbor. That'll be a challenge for that defense. That's why hold on to the football as long as you can if you're Notre Dame. I don't know how long it's been since I've seen a better half of execution offensively than I saw today. For maybe Notre USC Dame. and the Orange Bowl, maybe. Oh, I'm telling you, yeah, that could be the only other one. They were sensational with everything that Kirk is talking about. I got one advice for those guys out there. If you got a ticket to the Michigan-Notre Dame game next week, sell it for as much money as you can because that's going to be one great offensive battle, Michigan-Notre Dame and Ann Arbor. Wow!
Touchdown. Wow, from 0-6, and all of a sudden they're going to go gonna, shock the world. No, I didn't say that. I said it's going to sell that ticket or keep it because it's going to be a great offensive show. All right, we, we got to revisit those no, but let's numbers. give them the mulligan, the first mulligan of the year. So they're not going to be 0-6 or 1-5 probably. In the first six? Give, give me the revised prediction for six games. 1-5. Oh, come you got to stick to your guns. I'm, your, I'm just going to stay at 4-2. Courage of your conviction. Yep. She can stay it was Washington. Well, we'll see. All right, Lee. Like He's I nothing like if not Stick stubborn with Stick with here in Pittsburgh in the wee hours. That's good. We'll see a little later here from the banks of the Allegheny back to Reese Trev Markin studio. Uh, Chris, coach will change his mind once I show him what happened to that man's new team. Tyrone Willingham taking over <laughs> at Washington, the ex-Notre Dame coach. It, he was not, yeah, that was the look he had there toward the end. The guy who spurned Notre Dame found his new home down in the swamp and Oh, apparently the Gators are adapting to the spread option just fine. At least the passing portion of it may they. And speaking of adapting, new offensive coordinator, no problem. You've got Matt Leiner and Reggie Bush. It happens at every NCAA football game. One action changes everything. It's what Pontiac Game Changing Performance is all about. Vote for your favorite because you, the fans, decide every week which NCAA school earns a $5,000 scholarship contribution from Pontiac and the chance for $100,000 at the end of the season. A cataclysmic turn of events! Vote at Pontiac.com slash NCAA. Pontiac, official performance machines of the NCAA. When we got married, suddenly we had two of everything. They had a lot of stuff. Two dining sets, two dogs. Two car insurance companies. I'm State Farm agent Joan Raysom, and this is a true story. We had to get rid of a few things. Yeah, mainly my things. He had State Farm. She had a gecko. I helped them compare rates and coverage. It was no comparison. He was right. For once. This time, one of my things stayed. Last year, 1.3 million drivers switched to State Farm. Call an agent today, and you'll switch, too. Like a good neighbor? Stay Farm is there. He's got guns. He's got tanks. Where there's a will, there's a weapon. And he's got everyone hot on his tail. With the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. Let me guess, this isn't about the alcohol or the tobacco. Lord of War. Rated R. In theaters, September 16th. Built strong. Built comfortable. Built right. Wrangler five-star premium denim jeans. Wrangler. Real comfortable jeans. I'm Josh Elliott. Join me for Classic Now, where we take today's breaking sports news and give it to you with a deep perspective and backstory. Classic Now, where the past is always present. 7 and 11 p.m. every weeknight, only on ESPN Classic. College Game Day Final is powered by Pontiac. Vote for this week's game-changing performance at ESPN.com. Keyword Pontiac. No team in the modern pole era has ever won three straight national championships. Only one man's won two straight Heismans. Matt Leiner, USC against Hawaii, trying to get off to a start to take care of both things. Unless, of course, Reggie Bush runs away with that Heisman. Reggie ran away from the Hawaii defense, and SC was up early. Bush had a couple of scores in the game. Here's Liner to Dwayne Jarrett. Look at the protection by the offensive line. Matt oh. Liner's a terrific quarterback, but when you can stand tall in the pocket, no hands in your face, and throw the ball like that, it's tough to defend. That one broke Carson Palmer's school record of 72 touchdown passes, that being Liner's 73rd. And, well, Liner wants to stretch that record out a little bit. We'll pump and go to Steve Smith, who has himself an insurance policy. Oh, he doesn't have to go for two. Oh, that's the V for victory. Plenty of that. <laughs> Seven catches, 185 yards and a touch. Look at this, guys. Fundamentally sound. Look at the little pump fake right there. The little things. Look at the defensive back suddenly bite on it. Oh, it's a, no. Oh, look. Steve Smith gets Little it. help. Little help back there. Hey, safety, safety. 67 yards. They do the little things right. That's why they score touchdowns. You see Jerry Glanville? Jerry Glanville? I thought I left the NFL. Oh, he was, yeah. Well, these guys are going to play in the NFL. He's Hawaii's new defensive coordinator. Trojans brought some lumber on D and SC. 63 points. That's the most points the Trojans have scored since 1989. All of this great offense and this is number one performance. They stuck another one in with less than a minute to go. And remember, June Jones and Pete Carroll didn't <laughs> shake hands the last time they played. Not this time. They said everything was cool, but uh, that probably didn't feel too good. 63-17 is the final. Number one rolls, and so too did number two. Texas taking on the raging Cajuns of Louisiana Lafayette. And here is Vince Young. He runs it quite well. 
See, I love that call. You don't have to run the option a lot. You run it one time, Reese, and you have to prepare for it every week. Look at big Henry Mel. Look at that big freshman. They say he's too big at oh, 260 or so. Maybe a biscuit away from 275. They've got him in the backfield, and he crashed into the end zone. Here goes Melton again. Chop, 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 chop. Keep those feet moving off. Look at that big just running over the fender. He's got the good speed, too. Big fella going in. Pinch Young, big day. Texas 60 to 3. The Ohio State University taking on Miami, Ohio. Justin Zwick at quarterback for the Buckeyes, and he's finding Santonio Holmes. I think he looked great today. I mean, sat in there, was poised, threw nice balls, directed the team. Clearly the leader of that offense today. 7-0 game, and here comes Bobby Carpenter, and there goes Josh Betts. Later in the first, 10-0 Ohio State. Oh, Dante Whitner coming from the secondary. He gets the sack, but this really is, this is really what Whitner is better. Oh, what Pick a great move. Six. 20 to nothing Buckeyes in the third quarter is 27 to nothing. Todd Beckman, who when Troy Smith is not suspended, which he was for this game, is the third team quarterback. He had a terrific camp and he finds Ted Ginn Jr. The Buckeyes roll 34 to 14 over Miami, spoiling Shane Montgomery's debut as head coach of the Red Hawks and thus setting up without blemish in the first week. One of the most highly anticipated intersectional matchups at I don't know, I can remember in the last 10 to 15 years. Texas and Ohio State coming up next week. Maybe the Miami-Notre Dame games back when Jimmy Johnson and Lou Holtz were going at it might have equaled this type of anticipation. But Ohio State, they've got to figure out what they're going to do now at quarterback. Troy Smith suspended for this game, right. but he proved himself late last season. Zwick played well in the bowl game and in the opener. So what do you do now at quarterback to start against Texas? Well, I think that this is the toughest coaching job for Jim Tressel. I mean, the decisions that are going to have to be made here down the road for Ohio State. I mean, you look at this team. If you're a Buckeye fan, you say, look at our defense. Five sacks today. We held them to under 45 yards rushing. They never even got inside our own 35 until we put the substitutes in. They have everything you need. They have the defense, the special teams, wide receivers. Pittman got over 100 yards today. How do you handle the quarterback situation? Justin Zwick will start next week. He ought to. But you know the fans, Reese. They're one bad series. Something doesn't go right. Put in Troy Smith. He must delicately handle this quarterback situation. They have everything, but if he doesn't do it right and all of a sudden is a problem for this team, it could cost him down the road. Well, Mac Brown doesn't have that problem. He's got Vince Young. <laughs> well, he's going he's gonna to nice. play him at quarterback. And with Vince Young, I, I think the maturity is starting to show this year. And I think yeah. he didn't get a big test this week, but what he was able to do is throw the ball vertically, throw it short. I saw him stand tall in the pocket. That's one thing that they worked on in the offseason, him throwing the ball vertically, not taking off and running right out of the pocket as soon as he's pressured. But they have to let Vince Young be Vince Young. When he pulls the ball down and runs with it, he can make things happen. In this game, he rushed for 56 yards. Next week against Ohio State, everyone says, let him sit in the pocket. No. He says six foot five Michael Vick. If he can run and make plays, let him run and make plays. If he's going to throw the ball, that's fine. He can do both. Right now, I think he's maturing into that quarterback, and I think a lot of people will be surprised in this game against Ohio State. He will throw the ball against that defense. Bobby Carpenter of Ohio State said the Buckeyes' goal when Vince Young leaves Columbus, they don't want him to be a Heisman candidate anymore. Okay, uh, it's let's, started. Yeah, let's get it started Game a week on. in advance. Why not? Michigan. Early. In the Big Ten, Michigan's got one coming up in the not-too-distant future against Notre Dame, but a dangerous Northern Illinois team coming into the big house. They gave Maryland fits. They beat Alabama, but those two teams certainly not like Michigan. Chad Henney into Jason Avant, and the Wolverines on top 7-0. And then Henney strikes again to Mike Hart, his fellow sophomore. And Mike Hart is one of the best backs in the nation of following his blockers on screen. He's done this time and time again. He lets the offensive linemen get out there, sets their blocks, and then he takes the ball in for a score. Here is one of the top recruits in the land, Kevin Grady, who graduated early to go through spring practice. He gets his first touchdown, Wolverines 33-17. to Kirk Ferentz leading Iowa against Ball State. You know, back in 1916, Georgia Tech beat Cumberland 222 to nothing, and Iowa could have done that to Ball State had they chosen to do so. Javon Johnson on that little pooch punt. He's going to run across the field and then pretty much from one end to the other. There's a reason why Iowa continues to win, and not just against the opponents like this. They it was that fellow we saw at the twice. first. Well, you, listen, it's a quick punt. What's he do? Picks it up, has a presence of mind to take it in for a touchdown. They played against Air today. Ball State, which had 13 guys suspended in addition to their other problems. Drew Tate to Herb Grigsby, Iowa, 56 to nil. Still to come on College Game Day final, Omar Jacobs put on a show in Camp Randall and yet somehow was upstaged.
We'll talk about that and also show you the start of the Urban Meyer era in the swamp. The Cowboys came into town and Tennessee got a skip. And welcome back to College Game Day Final, powered by Pontiac. We are in Pittsburgh. In the SEC, some heavyweights took on the preseason favorites of some non-BCS conferences. The Blazers of UAB against Tennessee. Eric Ainge to Chris Hand and Balls led 10 zip, but Ainge had a couple of bits and struggled. Rick Claus, an engineer touchdown driver, was 17-3 Tennessee, but then Daryl Hackney in the Blazers rallied. Strong arm quarterback, nice striker to Reggie Lindsay. Uh, don't forget UAB thought to possibly win Conference USA, and they hung in there. And the longer the game went on, the more confident they became. Uneasy. 107,000 folks on Rocky Top. Seven-point game, fourth and seven. Lance Rhodes could not collect the pass. Fulmer's crew holds on. They have one more tune-up game against Louisiana Tech before they visit the Swamp. Urban Meyer's debut against the Pokes of Wyoming, one of the teams to beat perhaps in the Mountain West Conference here. And you can see that Ainge and Clawson really did kind of struggle. Got to wonder if this potentially turns into a quarterback controversy. It's the last thing Tennessee needs before we see the big game with Florida down in Gainesville in a couple weeks. Remember, Clawson led him to that big bowl game victory. Yep. So, you know, that guy's a good quarterback. How would Leak look running Myers offense down there? Well, it was already 17-0. And Leak and Chad Jackson hooking up again and again and again. That was his third touchdown, 23-0 here. Fourth quarter, once again, Chad Jackson. Touchdown number four. They kept missing PATs, but it was 32 7 on the Gator defense playing well against Corey Bramlett and the Pope's offense as well. Uh, the opportunity to see Chris Lee. Everybody wondered how he would hold up. How would he run Urban Meyer's system? Well, tonight, I know it was just Wyoming, but a chance to see what he would do running and throwing, especially with the arm. This is an impressive debut. He was frighteningly efficient running a very complex offense that we have not seen. Quarterbacks adapting the ball. Yeah, it's his 22nd career start, and it makes yeah, a big yeah, difference. Yeah, sure does. You see, not much of a running game. That might be a concern down the line for the Gators. They clearly miss Seatric face. And so, I mean, what do you make of yeah. it? The Gators now have the balls coming in. That was yeah. their kind of big tune up game. Are they ready for them? Oh, I think so. I, would have, I was most impressed about Chris Week is what he did before the ball was snapped. Remember, we talked about it this morning about 18 hours ago, was the <laughs> fact that there was going to use some pass protection calls in the line of scrimmage. He changed the pass coverages depending on the pass routes, excuse me, on the pass coverages. And most important, he became the South's number one Heisman candidate tonight because the guy can throw the football and he's doing a great job running it. I love this performance. Today. Pretty early for the Heisman for the South. Not DJ Shockley had a pretty good game yeah, in the that's South, true. too. But that's right. I, I, the one thing that... Uh, <laughs> One thing that I saw was when you had That's Utah's it. offense last year, Urban Meyer called a game with Alex Smith where he stretched the defense horizontally. And then he would use the option game to be able to try to get up underneath and try to find some opportunities to make big plays. What you're going to see this year with Chris Leak is not only a little bit of an option game, more importantly, he has so much speed at wide receiver. In my opinion, you're going to see Chris Leak breaking contain, rolling out off of play action, and throwing the ball vertically more than we've ever seen in Urban Meyer's system. That's the tweak, I think, with Chris Leak. Giving him a chance to get outside on the edge because of his speed, but more importantly, the arm. He, he seems more comfortable to me rolling out and throwing downfield. He has four receivers, four, three speed or better. Urban's a perfectionist. He's going to nitpick about oh, any aspect of that win. Yeah. He'll, he'll find a reason. <laughs> okay. He'll find a reason. He'll be ready. He'll get him ready. All right. Meanwhile, Myers' debut successful. Ron Zook, the ex Gator coach, goes to Champaign and tries to teach these guys how to win. They were home underdog to Rutgers in Champaign today. And Brian Leonard. Takes the handoff and the Illini just hurdles the defender. The Rutgers is up 27 to 7. It looked grim for Zook and company against the State University of New Jersey. 27 to 7, first game in Champaign. They're thinking, oh, oh, what kind of year are we going to have? Pretty good athletic ability there. Who's going to catch heck in the film session for that effort on the tackle there? The start of the fourth quarter, it's 27 10, and then Tim Racing completes the pass to Jody Ellis down to the Rutgers 13. No experience coming in bracing at all. Very slow start, had some turnovers. Then he found his rhythm and diving into the uh, end zone is Halsey there. Ties it at 27 with a buck 13 to play. Illinois missed a field goal regulation. They go to overtime. Rutgers kicked the field goal and then Pierre Thomas busted into the house. The big comeback victory. Hugs all around for Zook and his players. 
What a comeback and a great start to the Zookira. They just needed some reason to have hope. And one thing that's good about that, once you come from behind early like this, you're never out of the game the rest of the year. They got a lot of confidence in Ron Zook. And Ron Zook could not have picked a better type of game to get down, to show the character in the fight, to come back in your first game. His players believe everything that he says now, and they'll follow him anywhere. They gave up 5-17 to Rutgers, so let's have a little bit of a reality wow, but check. But still, what a big, big comeback. 27-7? And to come back and win, that's huge. Yeah, and Brasic, again, with no experience, played very well. Very damaging loss for Rutgers on the road to blow a big lead. Reese, let's go back to you guys. All right, Chris, we talked about it on Thursday in South Carolina. Clemson and Texas A&M might very well have been the game of the day, we thought. And it was a great finish in Death Valley. We'll tell you how the orange-clad Tigers fared. And also, Ryan Calhoun. Funny-looking helmet on the Badgers, but he certainly got it done on the ground. Welcome back to College Game Day Final, powered by Pontiac. The only matchup of Saturday between ranked teams Georgia and Boise State, DJ Shockley waited, got his first start, and got off on the right foot. DJ going 14 yards, dogs hunkering down, up 7-0 after the PAT. Jared Zabransky, fine quarterback for Boise State, didn't have a great day. Picked off by Daniel Ellerby, that was the second of the day, and Perhaps not since Tom Cruise started jumping on Oprah's couch have we seen a meltdown quite like the one experienced by Jared Zabransky. He had six turnovers in the first half. This pick by Greg Blue is fourth INT. And it wasn't like he was getting constant pressure. Here again, fumbled snap. Georgia recovers it. They're going to go on lead, get him the touchdown. That was a sort of day for Jared Zabransky. Overthrowing. It really wasn't a lot of pressure. Just had a poor day. 48 to 13, the dogs destroyed the Broncos, and Georgia now gets the head ball coaches team, South Carolina, is coming up next week. What do you like? DJ Shockley. <laughs> Georgia looked awfully good, but you're here to make predictions, not me. Oh. Bowling Green in Wisconsin since when, right? <laughs> Omar Jacobs, 41 touchdown passes, only four picks last year, and making believers out of Wisconsin early. Corey Pat Partridge with the catch. Alvarez didn't believe it was touchdown. He was mistaken. It was. Here is Jacobs, Steve Sanders. Great job by Steve Sanders. Pivots around, turns it, takes it down the sidelines, and it's like, catch me if you can. Takes it in for the score. But you know what? For Wisconsin, guys, it was all about Brian Calhoun. The transfer from Colorado was the difference in this game. Look at him here. He's not a big guy, but great vision. Pops it outside, then has the speed to get in the end zone. Wisconsin all the way back, 21 to 20. So Wisconsin able to go up 28-20, but Jacobs not done yet. Let his team on a drive, and B.J. Lane takes a handoff. Two-point conversion, tied the game at 28. Under a minute to go in the half, second and goal for the Badgers. There goes Calhoun again, 35-28. Bucky was starting to feel it now. Calhoun, one more time. Oh, did you see that block by Bernstein? You love Big Bernstein. 45. Just get in your face. Big guy low to the ground and knock you on your back. Here's Calhoun again, his fifth touchdown run of the day with Ty as Wisconsin record. He went for over 250, 258 to be precise. Boy, are they glad he transferred from Colorado. The Buffs, not so much. 56 to 42, Wisconsin over Bowling Green despite a brilliant day from Omar Jacobs, who after that great year last year, certainly started off with a bang again, throwing for 458 yards, completing just a shade under 60%. The touchdown to interception ratio, five to one, and he certainly kept his team in it against, I know Wisconsin's rebuilding on defense, but Bielema, great schemes, and they've got talent there, and Omar Jacobs looked terrific. Texas A&M and Clemson. If you're not ready to play, keep your filthy hands off my rock! what Frank Howard used to say. Second quarter tied at three. Chancey Stuckey. Oh, Chancey Stuckey. Life is an open sideline to Chancey Stuckey. Clemson takes a 10-3 lead into the first half. Tigers all orange all the time, looking to go up. Now, you know how I love kickers. Jad Dean, 25-yard field goal. That's his third of the game. That a boy. That a boy. I Kicker love kickers. Highlight. You got to you gotta like kickers. The highlight. Reggie McNeil of the top quarterbacks in the country. Chad Schrader. Aggies kick the extra point to make it 24-22. We are in the fourth quarter. Now, come and listen to my story about a man named Jad. Jad Dean. Sixth field goal of the game, and with that, 
Clemson knocks off Texas A&M 25 to 24. Jad Dean, the hero, and the great kicking game displayed by Clemson ends up winning the game, but the questionable decision by Dennis Franchoni, mm -hmm. nine minutes to go, and you know I'm no big fan of going for two, but in that situation, what should Fran have done? Should have gone for two, costing the ball game. At that point, it doesn't make a difference if you're up by one point or if you're up by two points. If Clemson gets the ball back, all they need is a field goal to win the game. I think when they go back and analyze this game, coaches will pick apart the entire game. They'll sit back and say, well, this play could have worked, this play could have worked, we could have scored again. No, but at that point in the game, if they go for two, it's a three-point game. It puts pressure on Clemson to try to win the game at that point or to tie it up and go to overtime. Is it time to offer the tutorial again to the coaches about when you go for two yes. and when you don't? Yes. We need to get that little card out that we have and we need to stand Not the card, card that everybody has, the one where we can, we just need a hotline. Can I talk about Clemson a little bit? Yeah, you bit? can talk about Clemson. Well, I want to talk about Clemson We're and the start the that they've had. I mean, we're dwelling on the negative a little bit, but what about Tommy Bowden, what he's done with his Clemson <laughs> program? Remember last year when they started 1-4, and four, and Charlie Whitehurst was terrible, had 11 interceptions. In the offseason, new offensive coordinator Rob Spence comes in from Toledo, and you saw a different Clemson team today. Charlie Whitehurst, 15 of 20, 188 yards, but the most important sack, no interceptions. That was a story. They got 100 yards rushing on the ground, a balanced offense. You look at this team now. They've always finished well. Now that they got their start, building some momentum, watch out for Clemson, Reese. Yeah, Clemson, they've got explosive uh, offensive players now. Charlie Whitehurst, you mentioned, got dinged up a little bit. Proctor came in, played well. Clemson, that's a great, great win. Huge win. Great way to start the season for the Tigers. We've got more from the ACC. And you know what, it was a good day for the ACC yes, too, as we'll talk about a little bit later on. And a great ACC matchup on Sunday night. Virginia Tech and North Carolina State. The Wolfpack, the number one defense in the land last year. They sacked Brian Randall 10 times. Can they get to Marcus Vick? 7.15 Eastern time on Sunday night for the Hokies and the Wolfpack. Another ACC team with quite a challenge. Auburn with a 15-game winning streak, but the ACC foe Georgia Tech bringing the lumber against the Tigers' young quarterback. And another thrilling finish filled with Auburn riding the nation's third longest winning streak, 15 straight. Both teams holding a moment of silence before the game. That's Eric Henderson before the game, did not know the whereabouts of his sister. He's from New Orleans. At halftime, Henderson's sister discovered she is indeed safe. Certainly great to hear that. That was Brandon Cox placing Jason Campbell at quarterback for Auburn. Reggie Ball finding Calvin Johnson. This guy, this guy's going to be an All-American. Tech taking a 7-0 lead. Just great ball awareness. Look at him here. Make sure he gets that foot down quickly to make sure he's in. Touchdown Georgia Tech. One of the best wide receivers in the land. Recently. Suffered from some cramps later in the game. 20-14. to 14, Tech had the lead in the fourth and Brandon Cox making his first start. Hit as he throws. Michael Hall picking it off of the jacket. That was a theme in the second half of this Georgia Tech defense. Under four minutes to go, Cox will be picked off for the fourth time, Jarris Wilkinson this time. And Auburn, through a rash of turnovers, particularly in the second half, becomes just the fourth team in 25 years, coming off a perfect season to lose its season opener. Georgia Tech goes into Jordan-Hare Stadium and spoils a raucous night for the Tigers, 23-14. Ball completed less than 50% of his passes, but he made plays when he had to, and they also got some business done on the ground with P.J. Daniels as well. 23-14 is the final there. All right, so uh, you look at Georgia Tech right now, and, and going on the road, the ACC team, a uh, team picked to finish in the middle of the pack. Auburn had some rebuilding to do, but this is, this is quite a solid win for Tech. Yeah, I spent some time down in Atlanta, and there's some people in Atlanta <laughs> not happy with Chan Gailey, the head coach. There. Happier they're now. Well, they want to see some things, some progress with this team. But I've said all along, I mean, Chan Gailey can flat out coach. But the one thing that Chan Gailey must have for his offense to work, whether he was in the NFL or whether he's in college football, is he has to have a power running game between the tackles. Everything he does offensively is the power running game. Here's P.J. Daniels right here. This is what the offense is based on. They play solid defense, and they want to manhandle handle you up front. See the big fullback right there? Lead right up the middle. Touchdown. That's what it's about. If they establish that power running game, that's what everything goes off of in an offense. Then you get the play action passes going, and Reggie Ball simply will look a lot better. The offense of Chan Gailey will work as long as P.J. Daniels is healthy and they run the football. Well, their defense did an outstanding job today with yeah. John Tanuta, the defensive coordinator, and what he wanted to do is wreak havoc on the offensive backfield because it's new for Auburn. They're starting a new running back, new fullback, new quarterback, and Brandon Cox, they wanted to pressure 
pressure him. They wanted to wreak havoc on that backfield. And this is how they did it. They got to the backfield by blitzing. Right here, look at this sack by Kamika Hall. Right here, putting pressure on Brandon Cox. Fumbles the ball, but Auburn does recover it. Now, pressure again in the quarterback. Under the quarterback, right there, the ball is picked off by Jarris Wilkinson. That's the key for this Georgia Tech defense, to put pressure on quarterbacks. You've got great skill people in the defensive secondary that can catch the football and intercept the football and make turnovers. Four interceptions today, one fumble recovery. That's why Georgia Tech won this football game. They controlled the Auburn offense. And when Brandon Cox of Auburn matures a little bit more, he has some weapons at wide receiver. Those wide receivers made plays, kept Auburn in the game despite those turnovers for quite some time. So Georgia Tech ends Auburn's winning streak at 15 in a row, 23-14. Virginia taking on Western Michigan and the Broncos, you know, they tried to just stroll in there to Charlottesville. Scott Field and walk out with a victory, but Marcus Hagans avoided the sack. He finds Ottawa Anderson. Hagans 17 to 25, 252, 31-19. Who? Get it done. Tyrone Willingham, first game as head coach at Washington, taking on the Air Force Academy. Air Force trailing 17-6, not known for passing it. But wait, this is the Air Force. You know they can go up top. Adam Fitch to Greg Kirkwood. And suddenly, the Fighting Fishers are right back in this thing at 17-13. Fisher to Barry's team, just over a minute to go. Sean Carney firing to Kirkwood. Touchdown? No. Stopped just on the goal line and two plays later. Time winding down. Carney gets in there. And the rally by Air Force spoils the debut of Tyrell Willingham. 20 to 17. The Falcons come out with the victory on the road. Still to come on College Game Day Final. Look ahead to the Seminoles and the Hurricanes. They will do battle on Labor Day night. Miami's won six straight. Any reason to think things will change? And we'll also show you the game-changing performance plays nominees. Boston College playing its first game as a member of the ACC, taking on BYU. First quarter, Boston College's team has an experienced offensive line. They've got a quarterback in Quentin Porter who's played after sitting out last year, but he played previously. Finds Chris Miller for the touchdown. The Eagles up 7-0. First play of the fourth quarter. A little staple, fake out the cameraman with a play action. Porter to Miller. Boston College opens with a win. 20-3 is the final. All season long, you'll be able to see plays that change game. We call them our Pontiac Game Changing Performances. You'll see nominees throughout the day, and you'll have the opportunity to vote on ESPN.com. The winner will receive a $5,000 contribution to the school's general scholarship fund, courtesy of Pontiac. You've seen several of the nominees over the course of the day, and without further ado, as they say when they don't know what else to say in introducing something, we show you one. TCU in Oklahoma, the fumble that turned things around for the Frogs. Here's Bomar getting pressure, and he will go down, drops the football, and it is picked up by TCU. That led to the TCU upset. Rutgers in Illinois, Tim Brasic finding E.B. Halsey makes it easy with the TD. Illini would go on to win in overtime. Great effort by Halsey, the, the tailback. Watch him elevate from about the four-yard line. He just gets up and over. You can tell he wanted that touchdown badly. Yeah, I'm going to be there. Air Force and Washington. Sean Carney to Greg Kirkwood at the goal line. The Air Force would punch it in later to win. Carney delivers it right on time. He gets smoked when he throws the ball. And Kirkwood going low for the low one. And Wisconsin and Bowling Green, just when it looked as if the Falcons might take the woodshed business of Wisconsin, here comes Brandon Williams returning a kick. Right here, does a great job of reading his blockers. Watch the acceleration. Bam! There's a kicker. I don't worry about him. But it's a great job of hustling by Bowling Green down the field. Not pointing on a play. Great play by Brandon Williams. And that final one is the fan-nominated play, which you have an opportunity to do on ESPN.com. So here are the nominees. The Air Force third down conversion that led to the winning touchdown. Illinois with a game-tying touchdown. They went on to win in overtime. TCU forced to fumble, set up their winning score and kept Oklahoma from moving. And the Wisconsin kickoff return that sort of changed momentum in the game. To vote, log on to ESPN.com. Your keyword there is Pontiac, and we will reveal the winners and who gets the five grand in the general scholarship fund on our coverage of college football on Thursday night. Chris Fowler and the guys down in Pittsburgh to watch the debut of the Charlie Weiss era. And Near as I can tell, that Patriot stuff works pretty well down in college as Notre Dame takes care of the Panthers. Chris and the guys at the Confluence.
Reese, thanks. Guys, I think one of the intriguing storylines this year, and certainly this opening weekend, is Marcus Vick's return mm -hmm. at Virginia Tech. He made some poor decisions, cost himself last season. Now, time is short. He's only got two seasons to make good and all that ability in that family name. But he's got to kick off the rust against a very, very tough defense on the road at NC State. They had 10 sacks against the Hokies in a win at Blacksburg last year. Held them to 185 total yards. They got a nasty scheme to unleash against an inexperienced quarterback. I don't know if he's good enough to overcome all that, Mark. You just, you just mentioned why I think North Carolina State's going to win the football game. I think they win the game by pressure and Marcus Vick into an average game. Then Mark Tressman, the new offensive coordinator, is going to let it go. And I think North Carolina State upsets Virginia Tech in a beautifully played game. All right, another high-powered offense that I think after this Pittsburgh loss here, Louisville has to certainly be considered the clear favorite in the Big East, that the oh, clear yeah. favorite to smack around Kentucky, who they shut out a year ago. Well, f the keys to the car are handed from Stephon LaForce to Brian Brown. Finally, he's going to get an opportunity to be the guy as a true sophomore, and I think they're going to get off to a great start. I think they're going to pretty much name the number against Kentucky, even though it's a rivalry game. And I'll tell you, not only Brown, but look out for Broderick Clark, who I think is going to explode this year, and then Louisville, Louisville offense, and not to mention you have Michael Bush coming back. They are loaded with skill players at Louisville. So you say Vic struggles in his debut. Brahms succeeds in big, his. Big. What about the quarterback debuts in the game Monday night in Tallahassee? Drew Weatherford for Florida State. Kyle Wright from Miami. It gets, again, nasty athletic defenses. Kirk, what do you do to prepare these first-time starters for all that speed and the intensity of the rivalry and everything that's at stake? early on in these ACC games. I think the, the best thing to do with an inexperienced quarterback, with a college quarterback, without exhibition games, is to get him out against the one, the one defense as often as you can in August to try to get him ready for the speed of the game in that first game, especially when you're opening up against a Florida State or Miami defense. Miami will win this game with defensive pressure on Drew Weatherford. And I expect Kyle Wright to have a better performance, even though he's on the road, because of Miami's ability to run the football a little bit better. I think Miami wins this football game, as we said, with their defense also Devin Hester running the ball and also John Petty, the field goal kicker. He gets four from Miami and <laughs> Miami beats Florida State. So they move the ball, but they struggle in the red zone. Exactly. If they can block the pass rush at all of the Knowles, he'll have a chance against that secondary. Cromarty, remember, out for the oh, Seminoles. Yeah, that's it. Yep. Let's see, again, young quarterbacks, good mm. defenses. That's the big theme as we see at this opening weekend, guys. <laughs> Defensive struggle a year ago for sure. Guys, you did not struggle against the defense and the skill positions that put up some serious numbers when we come back. And it's not just numbers, sometimes it's moments that will earn you the coveted helmet sticker. Some people like to get trophies, some just prefer to get the college game day final helmet sticker. College game day final is powered by Pontiac. Vote for this week's game-changing performance at ESPN.com. Keyword Pontiac. Been a good Saturday for the ACC. It'll be a great Sunday for somebody. Virginia Tech, North Carolina State in the Atlantic Coast Conference Showdown, 7:15 Eastern Time. Marcus Vick will lead the Hokies against that tough pack defense. UCLA taking on San Diego State. Aztecs never beat the Bruins. 0-19 and 1. Drew Olson to. Maurice Drew. Some people call him the Space Cowboy. Some call him the Gangster of Love. Some people just call him a Bruin running for a touchdown. 64 yards. UCLA up 7-0. The Aztecs then punt to Maurice Drew. Mark, this turns out to be a severe tactical error. Yes, look at him. Follow his blockers straight ahead. The best way to return a punt is take it straight ahead. Follow your blockers right down the field. Now it's a sprint. He goes to the house, 72 yards for the touchdown. Remember, this is a guy who rushed for over 300 yards against Washington last year. Perhaps UCLA plays a little better. People will talk about him in the same breath as they do Reggie Bush, his crosstown rival. 24-6, Drew Olson. Oh, look at Mercedes Lewis. He might be the best tight end in the country. 44-21, the Bruins beat up on the Aztecs. Colorado and Colorado State. These guys ever play anything but a game that comes right down to the end? Fourth quarter, Colorado tied the thing at 21. Hugh Charles bouncing it to the outside, and now the Bobs have not only tied it, they've taken the lead at 28-21. But on the ensuing drive, here comes Sonny Lubick's team. Justin Holland, Corey Sperry. Colorado State locks it up with 36 ticks to go. The Colorado has Mason Crosby, and he's got a big old foot. Tommy Tlutter, high enough, long enough. Ball game.
47 yards out, the Buffs, 31 to 28. South Carolina State and Alabama State, Cleveland McCoy breaks tackle, gets to the edge, and South Carolina State going up by a touchdown. It's 10 0 in the second quarter. This is a fourth and goal play, and Deshaun Baker goes in there, and South Carolina State wins it by a count of 27 to 14. Here are the players with the mad skills. That's skills with an S, skills with a Z, any way you want to spell it. Omar Jacobs threw for 458 yards and five touchdowns and over 300 against the Badgers at halftime. It was not enough. How about DJ Shockley, the senior, having a big day against Boise State? Great poise, great job by the offensive line. And you know what? It makes it easier when your defense gets all those turnovers for you as well. Kept putting him in good field position. Mayday, what about Jehu Colcrick of Michigan State? Three touchdowns, a big bruising runner. Wonderful job by Jehu. But look at the blocking he had in front of him. No one touched him. You could have yeah. made that. Absolutely. Kent State, the victim, 49-14. Jehu Colquitt going for 140 yards on his touchdowns. Those guys showed the big-time skills, and this is what everybody wants. What about the helmet stickers? Pass one out for Well, I'll tell you what. There's a young man who had to sit out because he transferred. Brian Calhoun comes from Colorado, goes over to Wisconsin. He gets 43 carries for 258 yards. Without Brian Calhoun, Wisconsin has a loss. There's no way they beat Bowling Green. An outstanding effort. Very tough. You carry the ball 43 times in a game. Excellent effort, Brian. Here's your helmet sticker. How about the TCU Horn Frogs, led by Gary Patterson? They go right down into Oklahoma's backyard and knock off old Bob Stoops. You know the Mountain West Conference this weekend? They kind of own those Stoops brothers. <laughs> Brother lost against Utah. Uh, I don't know if they own them, but, but they had a weekend rental on them with, uh, yeah. with Utah, with Mike Stoops and... Gary Patterson? Yes, they do, but Gary Patterson, congratulations. Outstanding job getting your football team ready to go down and beat Oklahoma. Hunker down, you hairy dog. DJ Shockley getting yeah, my yeah. helmet sticker, not only because he threw for nearly 300 yards and rushed for 85 yards, but because of what DJ did, sticking around, being patient, waiting his turn behind David Green, not complaining, being a great team guy, and it paid off in the opener against Boise State as the dogs roll, and DJ Shockley was a big reason why. Georgia offense looked pretty potent. We'll see how it fares as they move on into SEC play. They've got South Carolina coming up next week. Hey, you know what? We still have more football in this Labor Day weekend. We've got Virginia Tech, North Carolina State. Got Great game. On Virginia that. Tech will be in the Rose Bowl. Wow, you got them going all the way to the national championship game, huh? Maybe. And they'll lose by three touchdowns to USC. To USC? Oh, you've got them there, too. Okay. Back with more football on Sunday, Virginia Tech and NC State. We're up. Bye.